Hello, everyone. After years apart, it is our pleasure to reunite with fans from all across the world, starting here in beautiful Mexico City, home of the LLA and the playing stage of Worlds 2022. With more stacked groups and storylines than any other year in our rich history, players arrive at the Arena Esports Stadium, readying themselves for their first steps towards the Summoner's Cup. I'm lucky to be joined today by none other than Lyric and Jats kick off Worlds 2022 and the play-in stage. Woo. Boys, it's Worlds time. It feels good. The sun is shining outside. Yeah. <laughs> We're in the right time zone. I think, it, I think it just hit me. I think it just hit me. The world is here in NA for the first time since 2016. Since 2016. Uh, yeah. It feels pretty good, Lyric. It's good to have you here with us. How you doing, my friend? Yeah, it feels pretty crazy, you know, representing the LPL, but I am from the state, so pretty great to be part of Worlds, you know, coming back to America. And a very stacked play-in lies ahead of us. We'll get to the play-in teams in just a second, but first, here are the groups for the group stage. You'll notice uh, three teams per group with one empty slot. Those await the four qualifiers that we will determine over the next week of play here in the play-in stage. But I want to know from you two, early favorites to win it all or teams that you have your eyes on, just ones that people should consider when they're talking about favorites. I mean, coming from the LPL, you've got to put respect on JDG's name. I mean, they've played 10 games up against top esports to guarantee themselves that number one LPL slot. And honestly, when you have 369 Kanavi rolling all nines on that top side, it feels really hard to bet against JDG right now. Yeah, so I my answer is not necessarily the favorites. It's like this spicy dark horse prediction. I okay. think the favorites are the top of the LCK and then like anyone from the LPL. Interesting. So I'm going all the way to the MSI champions. Why have people forgotten about the MSI champions? Just because they're the fourth seed from the LPL, but I'll go with RNG. The guy on your screen right there, five LPL titles, three MSI titles, still needing that world title. Highly motivated. The patch is way I different. Love this best. I love <laughs> this <team> <laughs> <laughs> yeah. hungry. He's hungry for that world title. Yes. You mentioned he's a very decorated player, Xiaohu, there in the mid lane. But, of course, still one trophy eludes him. And while you both jumped for the LPL teams, and for different reasons, Jad, I like that you called out a number of the LCK teams just kind of as a bucket. Yeah. Because I'll steal directly from what you said on your podcast just yesterday. When you look at the numbers, historically, the LCK outperforms every other region by quite a wide yes, margin. Yeah, particularly do. in the group stages. They're always very consistent in those best of ones and qualifying multiple teams to the bracket and if you're playing the numbers game you have a higher likelihood that one of those four teams you know then okay, ends up champion okay. so even you, though they haven't had so the you? champion in the last few years so you got to look at gen g right okay, I, yep. I just figured that's a team yep. you got to call out if you're going to look at a team that's leading you know the lck that would be of course the team that you would start to look at here whether or not they can dismantle any of those very strong looking lpl teams 25 of 26 korean teams since 2014 have made it out of groups which team didn't though was it Gen G? Yeah, yeah there it is. <laughs> Gen G in 2018. Yeah, there it is. Okay, well, we're not going to repeat that, or at least we're going to attempt not to. Now, it's been a little while since we've seen competitive play in any of our regions, so we wanted to update everyone because there have been so many changes yeah, to the game. We're all the way accelerated to Woo. patch 1218. No Udyr enabled, but yeah, just looking at the nerf uh, section, so many of those were some of the most played champions in competitive league for people's regional playoffs. Absolutely. Anyone who qualified for Worlds played all of these champions <laughs> yeah. for the most part. Hexum was actually buffed and nerfed and adjusted, so he's everywhere in this, in this patch graphic. And it's going to mean that we play a completely different game. It's not the Sivir or Zeri, which one can get a pentakill first. It is very much going to be a different game. And like, I, I can, I've read all these patch notes. I'm looking at this graphic. I don't have time for this. There's too much. I, I feel like that's the craziest thing, right? Is coming in, even like talking to teams from different regions, like it seems like their reads on the meta, their reads on what champions we're gonna see are slightly different, right? We have things like Ezreal coming back into prominence, mm -hmm. Misfortune OP, Maokai maybe being here or there. There's just so much Kaisa's difference in, in different roles, which is why Kaisa being back, I like that RNG yeah, prediction. Exactly, and this is some Champions Q highlights from various streamers and pro players who have been grinding. Kobe eating. Always eating, yeah. by the way, on stream. <laughs> yeah. He ate some bad guacamole the other day. Feels fine. <laughs> and you can see there's just so much variety. And who told us to put the double clip in here? I think he snuck into the server, but this is yeah. a highlight from him. It was just, it's been so fun to watch Champions Q and see all the variety that is likely going to make its way onto the world stage. Yeah, so that's just a taste of everything that we've seen in Champions Q. We're not going to break it all down for you and what we expect because we're only about 10 minutes away from finding out for ourselves what the players want to bring onto the stage. So let's instead turn our focus to play-ins and the gauntlet ahead for both of our groups, starting, of course, with Group A. We've got six teams in each group, 
But Jat, when you take a look at this group, what, what are your key takeaways? What needs to happen? I think the biggest thing for this group, it is known as the far weaker group compared to Group A and Group B, it's to have a hot start. So whoever wins this group will automatically qualify for the group stage. And to me, that says like Evil Geniuses needs to take all of the opportunity presented with them. They got the easier group. Their biggest opponent in the group is Fnatic, who they play today, who will not have one of their starters. So EG has to start hot. Yeah, that's a big note. And that's game number two of the day. And, uh, and I do like to call out that, of course, Hilly's still out. When we flip on over to group B, though, Lyric, I'm going to hand it over to you. What are your takeaways here? Man, this is the group of doom. This group feels <laughs> bad for anyone not DRX or RNG having to go up against both LPL and LCK gonna need a lot of hope, a lot of miracles. Honestly, I'd love to see some more creativity coming out from these teams with the patch so new. I mean, mm. we don't really know what would be creative so far just yet, but still, just bringing, bringing a bit of oomph to try and find those upset wins. Yeah, well, speaking of hope and creativity, uh, we're gonna play a little game. Uh, entering into play-ins, we thought it would be fun to play a game called 90-50-10. A lot of you might be familiar with it. If you're not, here's a really brief rundown. Each of us came prepared with three predictions yep. today. Now, these are predictions that we feel will come true. However, we've bucketed them, bucketed them into categories that we feel the community would basically put these values on them. So yeah, the first yeah. prediction will be, okay, 90%. Most people would agree. Then the next one kind of coin flippy. And the last one, people would be like, nah, you're crazy. That's never going to happen. Yeah. But we're, we're, we're taking that stab. So let's get our 90% predictions up on the wall and see what everyone thinks okay, is going to happen oh. here. Oh. 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 Okay. Wait. No, no, no. Okay, wait. This is me. Okay, so we have to move yeah, yeah. to, to Mark. Okay, so right over here, yeah, yeah. fans boo you. Uh, loud <laughs> fans. So, oh, like, loud and this is a theoretical <laughs> prediction. Like, if I were to say that they were lucky to qualify for Worlds, mm. that would give me a no. lot of hate on yeah. Twitter. Or if I were to say that there's no chance that or they the make best, it to group stage. You know? I'm not so, saying those things, but right. if I were to say them, so here's, be very here's why I don't like this, is because you yeah. have a hand in making this come true. Well, <laughs> this is unfair. <laughs> There are some <laughs> teams right, that you can right. claim, and they don't have enough fans. Uh, so you have they to don't have enough fans. They got okay. a lot of fans. <laughs> They've got a Be lot of fans. Be careful what you say. They're very good. Yeah. James, All right, here, I'll jump in. I'm going to go with no silver scrapes. And my reasoning is basically this. The domestic playoffs. Oh. Dom so of our four best defines in plans. This okay, is just okay. plans. Of, our, of, of plans, I think there will be no five-game series. I think because, one, we still talk about how a number of, like, uh, four of the – or five of the teams, right? Rather, yeah. feel very top heavy yeah. and so I do think that ultimately those teams are going to smash three O's three ones and their best of fives also my other reasoning is just we had so many full five game series and silver scrapes like in LCS I need a break <laughs> I need a breather yeah. so I'm more just kind of like let's not have them let's save them for let's save them for the big stages you yeah know? I feel like I went with the least spicy one I'm okay. also the yeah, LPL caster but RNG undefeated through plans, through plans. I'm okay. not say the whole third. Well, I guess if, five wins. if they, yeah, I was gonna say, because yeah, if they go first, if they go first, they just get out. Exactly. They don't have to play right. best so, of five. Okay. Yeah, right. felt like a bit of an easy one, but good, good, good. Oh, I like that 90, stat. The 90. Let's get All right, let's take a look at the 50s because uh, yeah, the 90s should have been pretty easy. So, um, oh hey. Okay. Yep. Oh yeah, I'm over yep, here. Yep, yep. Okay, this is me. Um, why don't you go first this time, Lyric, and we'll come down this Saigon way. Saigon Buffalo beats DRX. This team is absolutely crazy. Their early game, they're just so spicy. You know, they're going to 50-50? Yeah, I think it's a 50-50. I mean, they're going to play once, right? Potentially. I love Could this. be more. So, Saigon Buffalo, <laughs> I, I think love they do this. it. <laughs> DRX, I'm sorry. Death, we love you. Buffalo is here to play. I am obsessed with this take. That's I like love saying it. 50 50, I, I roll one on a dice. <laughs> like, that's not. <laughs> what, what that's the best one. Sure, sure, sure. All right, all right. All right. All right. EG wins group A. Yeah, I mean, the two favorites in this group, EG and Fnatic. Okay. They have <laughs> a longer time playing with their sub than yeah. Fnatic has playing with okay, their sub. Yeah. So I think. And as we know, one out of two is 50 50. 50, 50 prediction. One yeah, out of go. six, not, not 50, 50 50. Whoa, whoa, whoa. whoa <laughs> they whoa, whoa, whoa. said it's a coin flip. Sure, go you for it. You guys just don't have enough faith okay. in the buffer. So world. for my 50 50 prediction, I'm going with the highest win rate is going to be Singe. And the reason why I think this is going to be the case is because I think it's going to get it's going to get played once by JoJo. He's going to win, the and then right it's, and then it's going to get banned, and they'll never see it again. And that's okay. why I think it. And the reason I'm going 50-50 because it, it, the one time he does get it, he might get smashed too. So that's for yeah, me. It literally sure. is a coin flip. Yeah. But I do think he'll Fair. get it once, and I think okay. it's a literal coin flip whether like or not he wins, it. and like then he'll it. never see it again. Okay, from here we're going to the ten percent. Let's see what we got. Yeah. Where am I at? Oh, uh, okay. Ooh, here we go. <laughs> this is me here. All right, Jat, we'll start with you. LPL fourth seed has never won Worlds. 
but they did win MSI. So this is one where I think about 10% of people would say that this is going to happen. But I'm willing to say, like, this is actually my dark horse prediction. I'll say it right now. 10%? I feel like that's a 20-30. I agree. They're actually, the you know, fourth I, seed. I actually feel like it's higher than yeah. that. But, I feel like it's never but, but their their MSI winners. <laughs> Come on, put respect on their name. Yeah. <laughs> Play both sides. And, and we've talked about, well, we will talk about, I think, at some point, how meta might suit them very well. I'm going to hop on over to you for so Loud Here Makes I have, Groups. Yeah, Loud Makes Ooh. Groups. Uh -huh. Going exactly against what Chat said. I, and, I, if I were to say those things, <laughs> yeah. I didn't say them. Okay, why, why do they make groups? In my mind, Group A is, like, completely open, right? It's yeah. a best-of-one format. All you need to do, drop one or two games, bam, you're in first, you're in group stage. I believe in Loud. Vamos. They're getting there. I coached in Brazil. Maybe a bit of bias and love <laughs> okay. there. Okay. But they're doing it. I love it. Appreciate I love it. All right, so I am going with DRX misses groups. And the reason why I'm going with that actually keys into something you called out earlier. If your prediction, 50% prediction, comes true, it'll knock them down, right? And the idea here in my head is I wasn't thinking they would do it. I was thinking Mad would do it. It's the B01 team. Okay. So I was thinking Mad ends up seed two. Yeah, right, yeah. which means that DRX wins against the four seed, but has to play the two seed from Group A, which is either EG or Fnatic. And, and I'm predicting that down. they lose that best yeah. of five okay. and don't make it okay. out. And so that's why I think DRX is going to miss out because they're going to, it's just because of the best of ones are going to make them the three seed instead of the two seed. And that's going to screw them. Fair enough. All right, that's our predictions. Make sure you're out on Twitter letting us know what you think is going to play out here in the play-in stage. That's a lot of games. Uh, yeah, it's a lot of games. We've got eight games ahead of us today. I'm not going to read them all out because that would take too much breath and time. So we're going to kick things off with Isodis Gaming versus Mad Lions, followed by Fnatic versus Evil Geniuses before Loud and Mega Bank Beyond uh, step onto the stage. Now, as we narrow in on today's matchups, our eyes turn to a rivalry as old as esports itself. NA versus EU, our featured matchup presented by Mercedes-Benz, Evil Geniuses versus Fnatic with regional pride on the line. Two recovering rosters powered by god-tier junglers will battle in a match that could very well make or break their play-in's fate. That's going to be great. That's going to be yeah. a very sick matchup. Again, that's game two of the day. Before we get there, it's the hometown heroes, Isaris Gaming, taking on Mad Lions. So let's go ahead and start with Isaris, uh side of things. This is a team, uh, hometown favorites, we say, because uh, not only are they from the LLA, LA, LLA region, three of the five members come directly from Mexico City. So playing in front of the hometown crowd has got to feel good. They're going to look to start hot here in the playing group Yeah, stage. and I think it's just great, right? And you never really know how that home turf, is it an advantage? Is it a disadvantage? More pressure. More pressure that's yeah. on you. But, you know, hopefully we can see some exciting stuff out from Isurus. And you never know if it's going to be an advantage having your family in the audience yeah. or being there in person. It can increase nerves or also hype you up to play better. So what a better team to, to start off Worlds with. Of course, on the flip side, we take a look at Mad Lions. We've already talked about how they are, you know, by many considered a top best of one teams. The end of their split, what brought them here to the play in stage, though, is I think what a lot of people are going to focus on, the fact that they weren't able to pull together a best of five in their postseason. Yeah, but I will also say that it is a much different patch than what they had to play playoffs on, and they have very good players on this team. They found a lot of success throughout the summer split. They have players with Worlds experience and even though it didn't go the best for them in 2020 when they didn't make it through play-ins they were the team that advanced to the quarterfinals just last year they were the top representative of the lec and i think have possibly gotten better from there there's a lot of people that will disagree with that statement i'm okay. not saying it is fact but they have four of five players that were voted onto the lec first all pro team and that was for their performance across a variety of patches. Their worst performance was the playoff patch. So now that we're at Worlds, I think we can expect some pretty big things from Mad. I mean, it's going to be very interesting to see, again, this idea that uh, that was following the regular season where they did dominate in best of ones. The fact that the meta seems to be changing perhaps yeah. back in yeah. a direction that might suit them. So the question then becomes, you know, for the LLA team, you know, and their road to getting here, how well equipped are they, you know, to take on this Mad Lions roster? I honestly expect them to do pretty well. They actually came into their playoffs. They weren't like huge favorites. They were second seed. They lost to the first seed in the semifinal best of five, were able to pull it back. They have like the most decorated player in the region's history in Seiya. And and yeah, I mean, playing out through that mid-jungle, I expect Isarus to be able to put up a fight. Yeah, and I think they have actually fairly different mid-jungle strategies. Yeah. We're going to see Isarus play more through mid. We're going to see Niski play through side lanes. So I can't wait to see this matchup. Yeah, it's going to be a fun one to kick things off all before we get to that NA versus EU rivalry matchup. We've, of course, laid it out for you. We got Isarus Gaming on one side. We got Mad Lions on the other to kick things off here at Worlds 2022. Let's get into it.
戛纳来说，这将会是超越过去的一年吗？我的梦想就是赢下全球总决赛。今年我会让梦想成真。El nivel de los play-in siempre ha sido difícil para Latinoamérica. Pero hoy, en México, es nuestra oportunidad. Deportes 선수에게 월드컵 우승은 어떤 의미일까요? Deportes가 이루지 못한 단 하나의 목표죠. 현역 프로게이머 인생의 활용 점정. Es ahora o nunca. 월지를 우승하고 박수 칠때 떠나고 싶습니다. 兄弟们的小组赛等着我们，我们小组赛见。The greatest challenge in this place is for sure going to be RNG. Estamos listos. We are ready. Smart si traven. Chimbi va dekta. Chimbi se smita. We are ready. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the kickoff of Worlds 2022 and the play in stage here in Mexico City. I'm Captain Flowers and joining me for the first half of the games today, the one and only Mr. Mark Zimmerman himself. Mark, are you ready for I, some Worlds? I'm excited, man. I've been just grinding nonstop for the last two weeks, watching VODs, watching Champions Q. There's so much hype heading into play-ins now that we have five major region teams competing for four slots, all the wild cars looking for upsets this is going to be an insane week and a half of games and we get to kick it off here with mad lions versus isaris gaming mad lions obviously a lot of fans from the lec looking at these guys not winning a best of five in playoffs not inspiring a lot of faith but having a regular season second place finish being a squad that has proved they can get stuff done and they got to get it done here i mean there's a lot of best of ones to the round robin stage they were dominating pretty hard in uh the lec like you said earning so many of those individual accolades the strength is there playoffs the stumble came through but i think this is a team that i still have a lot of faith in uh getting easily into the knockout portion of play-ins and then trying to make some noise through there we'll have to see we heard that a little bit from the analyst desk this is a difficult group you have drx rng as well as having uh, saigon buffalo as kind of the, you know, the main competition they're probably looking at 
fortunately for them, they're going to have some time to get their footing on the new patch in the new environment in Mexico City, like you said. Yeah. Having the fact that they're going up against Isaris today um, and should be a little bit easier of a matchup as well as wild car, uh, Wildcats later on. And because I we just had the camera on the Mad Lions, I do want to go ahead and mention for everybody out there, El Yoya and Unforgiven are playing in isolation. They had positive results on the tests, on the COVID test that they took. So they're still going to be competing here today, but they are playing from isolation. That's why you only see three of the players there on the stage, but it will still be that starting roster here for the Lions, going up against Isaris, the hometown team here for the play-ins. Yeah, you got to imagine they're going to be crowd favorites here. Uh, it was a very hard-fought battle for them to actually make it uh, to this for them. They had to play a five-game series, take down uh, their opponents in Estral, and as well as the fact that there was a base race, basically, like Nexus back and forth battle in that five-game series. It felt like it could have gone either way, but they were able to clinch that one out here for Isaris. So very excited to see a lot of them back on the stage as well. Seiya as well is a name that I think a lot of people will recognize if you've been following international competition for any period of time now. He is the arguably best player that region's ever produced, and he is continuing to make this, this noise, you know, showing up for Worlds yet again. And I mean, if you're going to have a chaotic playoffs, a chaotic finale, that prepares you for the play-ins. Because oftentimes, when it comes to Worlds, this is where we see the wildest moments. This is where we see some of the craziest things come out. Yeah, I mean, we are going through three patches. You saw as well in the analyst test that graphic of all the changes that have happened. There's always this discovery period that you go through at the start of Worlds where everyone's like, is that meta or are you trolling? I can't tell quite yet. Yeah. And eventually you get these scrim bubbles. People start cross-pollinating what they think is strong. And eventually towards the end, you kind of settle on that. But these early opening days, anything can happen. It's so fun to see the different perspectives of everything. I'm with chat. This is way, this is way too much information for me. I can't I will attempt this. Uh, All right, what do you got, Mark? I will attempt to oversimplify this drastically. First off, systems changes. Everything with stopwatch got a little bit more expensive, basically. Uh, that is something that's been a staple of pro play. You see going to like third and fourth dragon fights. There's yep. like nine across the board. Going to cost you a little bit more to get that kind of investment. The other big change for me, they, they targeted a lot of the S tier picks that were close to, you know, 100% presence or whatnot. But that was both sides of kind of the bot lane meta. You see a lot of the early game champions like Draven, Callista hit, as well as the Sivir and Zeri. And so bot lane for me is where I have the biggest question marks about what kind of meta are we going to develop in? Is it going to continue to be so bot lane centric like it was in playoffs worldwide for a lot of teams where yeah. you either dominate early or you hyperscale <laughs> late? Are we going to see utility marksman return? I've been seeing a little bit more gin and whatnot in Champions Queue and things like that. There's a big question around what's going to become powerful in bot lane. And I think a lot of fans are hoping the answer is just anything other than Zeri, who has absolutely dominated pro play so much since her release. Fans are hungry to see something else. Zeri's had to been hit with that nerf bat so many different times at this point, and I'm hoping we really get to shake up what those bottom laners look the, like. The funniest thing to me was when I was grinding all the VODs preparing for this, every, you know, English cast I heard was certified Zeri moment. You had an LEC, LPL, LCK, everyone was making the same joke, so hopefully, like you're saying, Zeri has been nerf batted out of here. We won't see her. We won't have any more Zeri certified moments. You never know, though. She seems to find a way to pop back in. There's some cheese build that people are going to figure out for her. Yeah, and that's going to be part of the fun is just seeing, like, you were talking about these different scrim bubbles, the, the cross-pollination, everybody figuring out, is their read good or not? Because different teams are going to have different reads, even just looking at the way the different regions work, especially minor regions, where things can get a little bit crazier, where they aren't so heavily dictated by strict meta, we can see some real worlds collide here. Yeah, absolutely. Isaris, for example, when I was uh, looking up their champion pools, they play so many champions. They had, I, I eventually in my notes, just stopped writing the champions they played and just said lots of single games on different champions. Uh, and for Mad Lions, for example, they were a team that uh, felt like the meta shift that came through in playoffs might not have been to their strong suit. Right. It became, like I said, either you stomp early or you hyperscale late. And the team's identity was more about mid-jungle, working together, getting across the map, these kinds of things. And it became very much about bot lane. All righty. Well, we unfortunately do have a delay on stage due to COVID isolation difficulties, getting everything up and running. While we sort through that and get ourselves into the game, we're going to toss back to the analyst desk to take it for now. Thank you very much, uh, Captain Flowers. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, while we have a small delay getting the teams all set up and ready to play, you're back here with us on the analyst desk. Uh, let's preview the matchup a little bit more because yeah. 15 minutes, that was quick for us, yeah. uh, a pre-show. So we didn't get everything out that we wanted to, so luckily we got some more content for you. Uh, what was mentioned uh, was the idea of mid-jungle yeah. specifically playing a big role in this matchup, and Jat, you followed up briefly mentioning that we just expect the, you know, kind of the mid-jungle to play differently on each team. Mm -hmm. Let's explore that further. What can we really expect to see 
in how these teams will interact and, and utilize mid laners junglers. Uh, Lyric, you want to start? Yeah, and I, I think Izarus is the, the more interesting one because, like, throughout their, their split, it wasn't all about playing towards say and playing towards mid. It was actually a lot about enabling their bot lane. But once they got into playoffs, everything went to mid lane. Grell ganking, we see Jelly linking up with them. And it's a bit of a, I don't want to say outdated, but you don't see as many teams playing specifically towards mid anymore. It feels like a lot more teams are kind of leaning in the opposite direction, right? Get pressure yeah. mid, roam the sides. But this could kind of make interesting opportunities against Mad Lions in my mind. If you could find these weird windows, even if you don't kill Niski, you get Niski's flash, he now can't start roaming the sides, and that could do a lot in shutting Mad down. Yeah, and it is an older school way of playing mid lane, but Seiya has been playing for so long and yeah. been at a high level for so long. He is very good at a style where you can see they're like, look at where the wave is. Yeah. That's where you hold the wave. It pulls the other mid laner up as your team collapses on him. It does get your mid laner far ahead, but then it's about how you play the game out after that. Compare that to just Niski, yeah. right? And this guy has been doing this for years across multiple teams. Like one of the best versions of Cloud9 was 2020 Spring Cloud9 with Niski in the mid lane. Mm -hmm. And he is completely about push and roam. I feel like when it becomes a control mage meta, while he's serviceable, he's a completely different player. So the MVP Niski, this is the LEC MVP. It's for regular season, doesn't cop playoffs. Sure. If it can become a push and roam game for him, it's going to be very favorable for Mad Lions. Absolutely, and that's why I think it's interesting to pull back in that patch conversation. And while we're not going to attempt to break down every single champion, Jad, I think it is worthwhile to, you know, to kind of explore what those changes will bring to the way that these mids and jungles play. The yeah. idea that things like Silas Galio might be back seems so ideal for a player like Niski. Yeah, Niski's Galio is so good. <laughs> if that if that becomes the thing that you play, but. Uh, I think this could also lead into a little bit of a, like, patch theory conversation. Okay. Like, I I'm curious what your thoughts are on this as well, Lyric, because for me, like, Zeri Sivir, the power level that those champions reached in regional playoffs was kind of the highest that role has been in years yeah. in terms of its ability to impact the game. And you can see, I, I, I saw a pop-off Sivir game in Champs Q last night, but it's definitely different. It doesn't have the same support. I was going to say, that's not isolated to just the 80 carries. It's also in part because of the support meta that's Correct. surrounded on, it. Yeah. And that, that we expect to change as well, too. Yeah, so I, I, I have my own opinions, but I want to hear your thoughts, Lyric, because I talked about this on my podcast yesterday. But where do you think this will push the meta into the direction of? I definitely expect us to see way more focus on topside, right? With, mm. with the, the support nerfs, with the 80 carry nerfs now being back to engage supports. We saw things like Fiora, Camille, mm -hmm. like all these different top laners buffed. I think it opens up a place for, you know, supports going back to roaming towards top lane. Like we saw RNG doing super well last year, getting that top lane matchup ahead. And like, like you guys were saying, right, maybe Galio's coming out in the mid lane. I, I still expect we'll have the Talia's, the Lissandra's, but those are still changes. Those are that great roamings. So <laughs> yeah. Push and move. So I do expect us to see a shift up from bot to top side. But with champions like Caitlyn and MF, I, I think this meta feels very like wide open. Like there's exactly. different options in what you can go for. Right. Because if you play Caitlyn, you're still trying to break bot turret extremely fast and you are still playing through bot lane. But I think specifically the support meta has a larger impact on what the other roles play than yeah. would yeah. be seen at first glance. And I think this is part of why Mad Lions struggled in playoffs because I think Kaiser is such a great playmaker and has such a good trigger pull for engages. If he's on Yumi or Lulu, he loses that strength. Yeah. And if he can get moving on Leona or Nautilus, I can see them finding much more success. So here's, I believe this is best of five clip, but it's, it's you know, they're still trying to play like a bot lane dominant style with mm -hmm. Lucian Nami, but it's still going to be different once you're out of laning this. Yeah, I mean, but so based on everything yeah, that you guys are saying here, uh, to me it sounds like the meta is very much in, in a sweet spot uh, for Mad Lions. Yeah. Or again, what we expect. It, it in might a sweet be. Spot. Yeah. Um, because if they have the, if they can go either top or bottom, the idea is more, but I guess, this, that this the comp they have right there on the left with yeah. Raven, Leona, they have Twisted Fate, they have Gwen top lane, they have volatile side lanes that Niski can impact. Mm -hmm. That wasn't the style that was winning in playoffs. It right. was low volatility, strong team fighting. I, I think especially when you look at this matchup specifically and kind of bringing supports and top laners into the conversation right both kaiser and jelly like love to roam moving up towards mid moving up towards top side and impacting the map the difference in my mind is in top lane where you know we have like add coming in who's a lot more of a 
kind of weak side play tanks just accept pressure coming to him to where I think Matt Lyons are much happier to like give Armut some pressure, give him some oh, attention yeah, up the top absolutely. lane. Yeah, absolutely. You know, you know what I saw ADD playing yesterday in Shamsky? What? Do you see this game? Zillion no. top. Oh, so he, he was against Orn. He went cull tier and just auto shoved every wave. Cull tier. Oh, yeah. Jesus. Death was his 80 carry and he was ahead on Caitlyn. So they just, they just <laughs> yeah. won. Yeah. Like they just won the game once uh, he had a couple items on. Yeah, Zillion. I guess I'll play Zillion top if Death's my 80 carry. Yeah, he, well, he, right? won, yeah. he won the lane. Like That's he was up in CS. Oh my God. Yeah. Cull tier. That's Zillion ridiculous. Top. I've heard the players are in seats and they're looking to get ready checks now. So we might be just about there, but we won't, we won't jump the gun on tossing you out to the arena until we get that go ahead uh you guys do your crystal balls speaking of things like a zillion top i did did you any like what's your kind of most wild crystal ball prediction or something that you think like other people maybe didn't think about yeah so i gamified it okay to try and win rather than try and maximize points i like it so if i i dark horsed rng to win worlds mm. which basically put rng players in all the categories like most oh because they have the most they have the most playing in both yeah. Yeah. that's gala right so my pickums is just full of rng okay I like it. But this is after you said earlier yeah. that the four seed for the LPL has never won Worlds. They have not. And so you are just re <laughs> you really are playing the numbers game in that yeah, regard, I, or playing I, to win, I, rather. I just love that I feel like, especially the 90-50-10, we got like both, both sides of the sentiment yeah. of RNG of like, we got it all. Dark Horse favorites, <laughs> but, uh, you know, four seed. Right, yeah, 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 absolutely. I, what about you? Did you have any wild predictions in uh, I either? Oh, uh, no. I was, I am. Everything to chalk. Do you exactly. remember what your LPL wins it all? You're like highest win, because what was it? Highest win rate champion was one of them. Yeah, and but it was with five, champion. but it was with five games played, I think, on the highest yeah. win rate. So that it's was the tricky. other trick, because again, like I said, I think Sims will yeah. play once and win once, but yeah. getting five games is such a, it's like a weird benchmark i i like mine okay because I, I i of course i, I better <laughs> I, I hope i hate do. my pick yeah uh, i did belvath oh Ooh. yeah i think it's a little sleeper i like i, think I it's feel a like i haven't sleeper. seen a belvath in forever yeah. i uh, even when we got belvath in lpl from like kanavi who is amazing i'm uh -huh. like i don't like this pick this yeah this pick just how, how do you build around a belvath that's like for me i don't really understand how to build a comp a competitive comp that includes a belvath so here's the play <laughs> okay yeah <laughs> when RNG, when RNG is playing against a team that they're very confident they're going to beat, ah. they're going to be like, "All right, you can get some farm on your jungler. Pick Belvat." <laughs> so highest win rate with at least five games is going to be all five of their group stage games it's gonna playing be Belvat. They're, they're going to five zero to fulfill his. A prediction. Uh, something uh, like this. Something yeah. like this. I it think he's going to be picked in it lopsided sided It can all work together. Yeah. Okay, interesting. Belvath is the call. <laughs> we'll have to see. I would love to see it. Just mostly because, again, like my, yeah, I, I have so little experience with her just even as a player, right? Like, yeah. I'd love to see people actually play around her and show me what honest. her real strengths and weaknesses are other than just damage output. I did go a little bit more standard, but still a bit off the wall. Okay. From talking to teams, it seems like. Some teams like really like playing Tristana right now into like a lot of the meta bot lane matchups, especially in the East. And then like I've talked to Western teams and they're like, ah, oh, no, this this pick doesn't do anything. Ooh. It's a situation. I'm like, okay, that's a good if, one. If teams like RNG, like Gala or Viper, whoever come out and yeah. we're not seeing Tristana all that much to where she's banned yeah. or meta, but these guys are playing her and she's winning. I feel like if I love hearing solid. stories like this of of the pro players' perception of meta, especially on picks that are like 50-50. Like half yeah. of the teams are like, no, it's totally crap. Half the teams are like, it's such a busted pick. And like we'll yeah. find out in the first couple of days because yeah. that pick will either go 06 or go 60, and then everyone's either going to be trying to pick it up or trying to drop it and replace yeah. it. Yeah, and that's th there's usually a pick each year that is really good in scrims but doesn't translate to scrims. Yes, exactly. Right. I remember in 2019, and I know I'm projecting, like showing that I'm a dinosaur here, but it was Echo huh? from 2019. Oh. Yeah, 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 a three-year-old dinosaur. Yeah, three-year-old okay. Tyrannosaurus Rex, <laughs> tiny yeah. little arms, can't get to, can't gain. Um, but Echo was picked like every game in the first day of play-in, yeah. couldn't win a game, and then just fell off a cliff. Yeah. But it's because like in solo queue, it was carrying games. And even in scrims, when people were looser, it was pulling off successful ganks and carrying. Right. But, like, its baseline clear speed wasn't high enough to actually show sustained success. So maybe that's Belvath. Maybe that could be. Yeah, maybe that's that Belvath. could be. I remember tw same 2019 Worlds meta going in. Yeah. I was coaching Flamingo. Renekton in every game is crushing everyone. Yeah. Go to stage, and it's like, oh, my God. This is the biggest bait what pick in the do universe. Porn? <laughs> what do we do? Yeah. <laughs> uh, in a weird way, there's like I, I apply like similar logic to to why the LCK numbers are so high in terms of uh, like win rate, especially okay. in group stage and stuff. Yeah. It's kind of like it's this idea that um, 
I think their approach is so much more measured to the game, yes. right? Historically yeah. has yeah. been. And so similarly, like they're going to just take less risk mm -hmm. throughout the earlier stages of, of the tournament. And in best of ones, if you just truly believe you're better and you play the most solid version of League of Legends, yeah. you just have the highest percentage of not being caught off guard and losing to you know an individual mistake. I think LPL team's a little bit more willing to fight yeah. fire with fire, and sometimes you get burnt that way. Yeah, and this actually is really funny, because I remember talking to some of the LPL teams last year, and I brought up the notion of, like, you know, you hear it in the West all the time about, like, oh, hey, what are these guys fighting over? They're fighting for nothing. There's no dragon. There's no yeah. this. There's no mm -hmm. that. And the LPL coaches were like, wait, what do you mean? Like, right now, my comp is on a power spike, or there's this, or there's that. If we win this fight, we're further ahead in gold. They're more behind. Like, we could push the game further. I feel like that sums up how LPL teams see the game, is that yeah. if there's a way to outplay this fight, or if we have a flash advantage, or this or that, they're going to take it every single time. Yeah, we, we still have a delay, because my answer here is long. Yeah, we're still in a delay. <laughs> Trust me, I'm not holding us here just for no reason. I do enjoy yeah. our conversations, yeah. but those um, can continue even when the already. game Come is on, just man. Yeah. Please no, go, no, yeah. No, this is fun. It's it's kind of about, like, especially from a, coming from a major region, like, which team is going to have a higher likelihood of success in the play-in stage. Yeah. Right? Okay. Um, and I can talk about 2020 TL when we went to play-in, and... The way that we generally played was kind of like a boomer team. Okay. Right? Smaller champion yeah. pools, good scaling. And that's really good when you are the better team. Exactly. When your individual players are better because they're more likely to have at least a reliable non-volatile lane phase, sometimes with a straight-up win lane phase. But if you get to late game, you're going to win. So those teams tend to excel in playing. Where those teams struggle is when they're playing against equal or better teams. Yeah you have a much lower chance of winning. So that's when you want to increase your volatility, which is what we ended up doing in 2020 TL. Yeah. Picked like nothing but early game, almost made it out of groups, went three and three. So this also, I think, ties into why LCK wins group stages, but LPL wins, wins the worlds. tournament. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> right? Exactly. Yes. So it's less, it's actually just straight up worse in terms of securing best of one victories, mm. but more likely to give you a long-term win. So if yeah. I'm looking at this matchup in particular, like I think Mad sh should just honestly play what they're good at, right? Which is going to be push and roam. But if they need to favor a side, it should be scaling yeah. for this particular matchup. Well, I also think just to the point about LPL teams and having the more recent champions, I think part of that too is like, more and more as time has gone on in in uh, Global League of Legends, we see that the team that winning is generally, quote-unquote, defining the winning meta, right? Like, as yeah, the tournament true, goes on, true. like, you think about FPX, and it's like, oh, well, I didn't, you know? And then Niski immediately follows suit in 2020 spring, yeah, yeah. right? Of like, oh, that's how you play mid lane now. Yeah. And so there's kind of this idea, I think, that, like, well, yes, you can play solid League of Legends. You can kind of play this, quote-unquote, status quo, and if you are just the better team, you're going to pick up wins. But when it gets down to those final eight, those final four teams, it's more about, like, can you find that extra inch, right? Can you find that extra ounce of creativity or that pick that's going to unsettle the team that is playing solid League of Legends, and ultimately that's going to get you the third game that you need, you know, I, in a best of five. I also feel like that's why... Like, overall, I'm never surprised if, like, LCK can get more teams that go farther in Worlds than LPL because mm -hmm. I also feel like LPL teams are way more, like, indexed into specialties. I feel like LEC... They're all taking swings. Yeah. And I some mean, of them are hitting and some of them are missing. LEC kind of feels in a similar vein to where I feel like LCS has always felt a little bit more like like the LCK. Trying kind of like, to be... Exactly. Generally yeah, 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 you could yeah. have, like, more general strengths. You don't heavily index into one area. But, right, when you heavily index into, like, your strength so much... That also leaves your weakness super exposed. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, so I, I, again, it'll be very interesting to see if the statistics hold true, right, uh, mm -hmm. this year. And, mm -hmm. and whether or not the tides start changing. I know that when you looked at that, Jack, you looked at a very specific one. It was 2014. 2014. Too? So it's basically modern world's format. Right. Because in 2013, the group stage format was different. But did you do yeah. any looking of like... 18 to 22, right? Like mm. the last four years. Because I wonder yeah. if then it's actually like LPL is now winning percentage-wise just because if it, it, it's like, are we just taking too much of the data from the Korean years so, of dominance? So no, because even, oh, even last year, only two LPL teams made it out of the group stage. FPX imploded, right? right. And LNG, LNG barely LNG. missed with that group that went all three and three. That's right. Whereas all four LCK teams actually made it through yeah. last year. Okay. Even, Han even Hanwha. There you right? go. So the group stage record last year for LCK was 18 and 6, Woo! and for LPL was 13 and 11. 
That's a move. That's yeah, like, that's not, that. And then, and then win the damn tournament. Don't yeah. bring back the memories of last year group stage, please. But you, I mean, but who cares? If you get, if you get the team all the way to the finals and lifting the trophy, have man. You seen I don't care if it's dirty. It's have exciting. you seen Doonby's dance and smile last year? You'd feel that too, my man. Uh, I'm told we're still waiting uh, uh, on player setups and things like that. Um, there are a few Mad Lions players missing. There are a couple yeah. missing. Uh, as we know, we're you know dealing with uh, an imperfect COVID situation, so getting players set up in isolation uh, rooms is uh, it takes a little bit of work, a little bit of extra work, but we'll get them all set up. Uh, and then as soon as we're ready to go, we'll make sure that they're playing in the best of possible conditions. Uh, you know, kind of trying to refocus a little bit on uh, the, the matchup at hand. Uh, I want to bring it back to just East Coast Gaming and. Uh, this this team that finds themselves, you know, representing uh, the whole of LLA and getting to play that first game and open the show in front of a hometown crowd. Mm -hmm. Again, pressure, you know, pressure uh, inflating or pressure diminishing, be damned. You know, I don't care so much. I think it just, so much of the focus for this team is going to be about starting it out on the right foot. Taking down Mad, who we've talked about, is a real threat in yeah. this, you know, best of one round robin. And, yeah. and taking them down here already puts you in very solid position to at least get to play one best of five. Yeah. You know, for your chances out and into the group stage. Yeah, and I, I feel like... I feel like Isarus, I really hope to see them do well because, again, just have it, being that hometown favorite is so cool. But I feel like the biggest problem they just have to crack is, like you were saying earlier, a Niski LEC MVP. Like, again, sure, the best fives didn't go his way, but how do you keep this guy in lane, especially when Seiya was leaning pretty heavily in playoffs on the Azir? It's like we've seen, okay, Azir get hit a little bit. We have mm -hmm. seen in Champions queue things like Victor and these like mm -hmm. other mages mm -hmm. coming to things. But it's like, how do you lock this man in lane and keep him from impacting anything? Because if you can do that, I think Azirus have a like realistic chance to get there. Their mid game and late game team fighting all split long was good. Uh, and yeah, just about can you keep Mad down? I agree. And I also want to go dive into a little bit whether or not being in your hometown is an advantage or disadvantage. Okay. Because in theory, it should be an advantage. Yes. Right? I mean, even look at what, what's happening right now. International travel increases COVID risk, which increases the risk of the you're not going to be able to play a five together on stage. If I go back to 2020 Worlds, when there was a 14-day mandatory hotel quarantine in China, you would think that the teams that spend that 14 days in hotel quarantine leave the hotel and are immediately playing on stage, which happened for almost every team at that world championship, except for LGD, right? Every other team that's not the hometown team should have been in the disadvantage, yet LGD was the team that actually underperformed the most mm -hmm. in the play-in stage. And I think that is about pressure. Yeah. So I think the environmental factors disadvantage the teams that are traveling, but the pressure is actually so large when you are at home with the increased expectations that it can balance that out or even make it harder. Now, I, I under, this is not going to be a, a perfect one-to-one -one comparison. Yeah. But I'm going to pull in the NBA, right? Absolutely. Because I do understand that, obviously, like if you're playing on a home court, there are, there are some things there that you just you feel. That you you make feel yeah, out. exactly. You are familiar yeah. with the court and the space. And it's not like these guys are playing in their home studio no. on the normal setup that they play on all year long, right? And yeah. so I'm not going to try and draw a, a perfect one-to-one. -one, but <clears throat> NBA, t NBA teams have a 60% win percentage yeah. from a home court. Like, yeah. that is not a small no, number in terms of, no. you know, like if you just assume all teams are evenly matched, to have a 10-point swing like yeah. that is pretty massive. And so that's where I'm still wondering. I'm like, I'm almost inclined to say, but maybe this is just me speaking as a person and what feeds me. Yeah. Like, I like pressure. So uh -huh. I like being in that home arena where there is a little bit of expectation and I don't want to let people down who are, who are right there watching me. Real quick, and then I want to get your idea, idea about the home stadiums in LPL. But oh, yeah. for, for NBA in particular, yes. you know, I think it's the refs. Like, I think... <laughs> I think they are influenced. I think they are, oh, I'm so no. mad you weren't on yeah. a single. No. I wanted you in yeah. frame if for that statement. I, I think I refs think are influenced the refs. by the fans, <laughs> and it changes the way they whistle. Oh, and that's no. what it has the win rates. The courts are fairly standard. The lights are a little different. When does the Jack Raz NBA podcast yeah. come out, man? Uh, <laughs> we have, you actually have some experience yes. with home court, even though I know China's... in. If, if you can think back to like 2019 when they were actually doing yeah. the different stadiums with with home arenas, what, did, do you think that was an advantage for teams that were playing at home? Or I, I think away? it definitely helps. I think the one distinction, even kind of bringing it to NBA versus like this or LPL versus this, is you think about it, right? 
now not like having internationals, not having like events with crowds and things like this. I mean, who knows the last time, like how many times have they played in front of their families or their loved ones or like people cheering them on to where I yeah. feel like in NBA or like in LPL, I mean, you're playing in your home, you know, arena, like at least Half every other time. week or so you, you familiar, familiarize yourself with it, right? Yeah. So where these guys, I mean, who knows? Again, this could be like their first time playing in front of their families. So. That's, a, that's a really good point. I think uh, this will be showing our age a little bit as <laughs> yeah. esports okay. dinosaurs, right? It was like, it's just the fact that, okay, so for us, I think the majority of our world's experiences are still those that have live crowds, you yeah, know, yeah, across absolutely. all the stages and, and that hasn't been the case in the last couple of years. And we can blind ourselves sometimes uh, to, uh, to the- Yeah, you uh, old to the, Yeah, to, well, to the youngness of our player base, right? Yeah. And, and our pro players. And it's like, oh yeah, actually the 17 or 18 year old who's first time at Worlds here and has only been a pro for two or three years has never played outside of some form of isolation. And so yeah. this really is quite a different experience. We've even seen that from regional playoffs going to finals and having live crowds for the first time in this last year that different players have had, you know, different, different ways responses. of dealing and different yeah. responses to that added pressure. So it, it is a super valid point and, and, you know, time will tell whether or not they can live up to the pressure. Um, but I'm getting word. I'm getting word that I can hand things back to Captain Flowers Let's and go. Marcy, which hopefully means Woo! we're just about ready to dive into the games. Gents, take it away. Hell yeah! Let's do it, Mark! We're doing it! We're in Champion Select. I can see it on my screen. It'll be on yours in a second here. Finally, we're underway. Apologies for the delay with having to get the isolation chambers or whatever we're calling them set up for the players who couldn't make it to stage. I gotta get myself hyped back up, Mark. Gotta get myself ready you to go juiced. again. You were juiced before. Gotta, gotta get you juiced again. Gotta get that blood pumping. All right, so we're getting into Champion Select here. First game of the tournament. First game of play-ins. Mad Lions versus Isra's. There we go. There's our champ select. Let's see how these bands are going to shake out with Draven being the first band. Here. All right, we were talking about way back before we went back to the analyst desk about the bot lane meta, what's going to evolve. Caitlyn obviously has been seeing a lot of play in Champions Q. We've seen some misfortune as well. Draven hitting the band table despite getting nerfed a little bit on the recent patch, still strong enough to want to get that one out of their hands. Uh, Unforgiven also is a Draven player himself a little bit, so that's just some young work done probably by the side of Isra's getting that one off the table. Unforgiven played a lot of champs in summer, about 10 different ones, which considering League of Legends was mostly just Zeri and Sivir plus guests, that's pretty impressive. So I don't think they'll be able to completely remove his pool, but they are taking plenty of time thinking about this next band here. Uh-oh, Mark. Oh no. Mark, please. I, I, have, I have some disastrous news for you, Captain Flowers. Mark, please. We've, no, Mark. We've left the lobby. I'm, I'm, no. I'm, I'm glued to select uh, the uh, the lobby chat to see if they say anything. Prior to this, Niski was very vocal, as as is usual for him. I think he was he was trying to joke around with the Isaris players. Uh, Isaris players were somewhat joking back. <laughs> somewhat joking back. <laughs> the secrets of the inner lobby chat that not everybody gets to see. Uh, it's a it's a privilege for the casters to be able to kind of backseat this. Uh, at one point, Niski made a joke, and uh, I forget who it was said no one laughed from the Acerus <laughs> side that's in Niski's jokes were falling a little flat but you know uh I'm sure they're just trying to keep the mood light with the issues that they're going through it's it's a little uh disappointing for fans as well as you know the players are obviously eager to to get the games underway we're doing our best to, to get these going yeah everybody's obviously tilted at the fact that this is having these delays that this is going on like that um looks like we're having an issue where one where Niski is saying the coach can't see the draft so assuming the coach is in one of the the rooms maybe they have to uh, get that monitor working for him uh we'll see how long that takes to get solved assuming Niski is not lying which i don't think he is i would expect not uh do we have any other updates in here mark i can't read spanish uh this is the unfortunate part for you and i <laughs> <We> cannot <laughs> read spanish uh, a lot of spanish players on mad lions as well able to communicate with uh the latin american representative isaris and now Isaris has left the lobby. I'm not sure if we're going to be remaking that, if they just all need to rejoin it, exactly what's going on. Hopefully we can get this resolved ASAP while Mark takes a look into that. Uh, let's see. Do we have any fun facts for you guys? Uh, Unforgiven. Unforgiven. You think we're going to get that, uh, that pocket Karthus pick sometime here? <laughs> of course. Game one, I expect, actually, Kevin Flowers. Yeah? No. Okay. Uh, I, I expect you heard the analyst I was talking about trying to keep things maybe a little bit more standard for Mad Lions here. If you want me to do a little bit of stake setting, there's there's some things to talk about. I mean, they already talked about a little bit of the disappointment of the um, not winning best of five, how they kind of dropped off from the regular season form despite all the individual accolades. The other bit of spiciness here is Ooh. that thus far in play-ins, 
the only time a major region top four team has not escaped play-ins, it was 2020 Mad, Mad Lions. Lions. Now, here's the thing. There's five teams in only four spots. Five uh, top four region teams, excuse me. So, so somebody's got to lose. Someone's got to lose. Someone could be joining them. Or if things do not go well, Mad Lions could hold that individual record twice. So, that is doomsday scenario. You do not want to have that title. It, it's like a bad title in an MMO. It's one of the ones where you just rather have nothing instead of that. <laughs> yeah. You do not want to be the team that had that happen twice. And especially coming off of the playoffs in LEC, like I talked about at the, at the top of the day, where they weren't able to get a win in any of those best of fives in the playoffs. They're still here at Worlds. They got a lot to prove. They don't want to be the one team out of the five left behind in the play-ins. They don't want to be the team that went from zero best of five wins to then having a poor showing in this play in stage, I want to see these guys come out swinging. Yeah, I think they will. It's a lot of extra pressure that they might be feeling. Everyone's going to be feeling the pressure at Worlds, of course, but uh, to have the, those kinds of things, maybe in the back of your mind, you're trying to focus on the game to, to be worrying about. Uh, I, I am fairly confident for Mad Lions, though. I, I love Niski, man. I know we were just talking about him in his banter, but also just him as a player. I, people may not remember this, but way back when he was in North America on Cloud9, uh, he... Did not win MVP, but he had back-to-back -back junglers playing around him win MVP. Sven Skaren and Blabber both won an MVP with him as their mid laner. He could have been, I would argue, an MVP in one of those seasons. Uh, it definitely felt like, huh, two junglers back-to-back -back MVPs, same mid laner. What happened here? And the mid laner plays this roaming play style. I wonder if he was maybe a, a secret ingredient of that. Exactly. It's exactly what the desk was talking about, looking at Niski as more of this facilitator, looking at him as this roamer. He's not the guy who has to be the 3,000 APM outplay you, you know, drop the base, like wub wub montage. <laughs> Dude, he'll play Galio and he'll do good on it. He'll it's, it's one of the things that you see sometimes. He'll take some of these trades. It's just setting up for the team to be able to make their own kinds of plays. It's not all about Niski. It's about setting up for El Yoya and being able to play around him and get the sides going. Yeah, absolutely the case. I think that's one of the things that we talked about, maybe them struggling with a little bit in playoffs. Uh, Niski played... A unique champ every single game except the very first two games where he played Talia back-to-back. -back. And after that, they were kind of uh, trying a lot of different things. They actually did try some of that wub-wub hyper-carry mid lane style with, like, the Cassiopeia coming back, which is a big pocket pick of his, one of his best champions, but not necessarily can do his play style as well, even though he is good on that champion. So they oh. do have to adapt. Oh! You, you see it? Oh! Is I'll it happening? Back. Mark, we're we back. just might be back. All right! Get Come the music! On, there it fourth is! Ban. Come on, fourth ban! Did we not even get to fourth band last time? Nope. Callista! We, we, yes! All right, we're further than we've been so far today, and that is progress. All right. All right, so Callista banned off as well. Also seeing a lot of play in solo queue and champions queue right now. I saw some crazy attempts with different builds. There was some uh, pen lethality eclipse Callista build where your Q is doing like 600 damage. I don't, I don't really think that's going to be <laughs> the play, but you can see that taking away some of the power picks despite being on that big old ban uh, nerf graphic, still being given respect. So we've got three out of five marksman bands here in those first five bands. Okay, so Juani's gonna be the last one. So solo laner focus. Let's see how Isaris wanna start this one off. They're immediately going to grab the Graves. All right, Graves, if you've been following Champion Sky, I know we've been talking about a lot. You're gonna hear a lot about Champion Sky probably in the first day uh, because it's, it's some of the best data we have to go on, publicly available data at least. Uh, Spika dropped a 29 kill game. <laughs> Uh, going up against some of the T1 guys. And so people have been eyeing this champion as absolutely disgusting. I think you will see a fair amount of carry junglers, potentially with Graves, with something like a Hecarim being uh, identified by a lot of people as being pretty strong, probably. Did get a uh, hotfix nerfed a little bit, but still with the changes that came through, there he is exactly on time. Look, makes me look like a genius. I love it. Uh, yep. The changes that came through, if you have not been keeping up with patch notes for Hecarim, the big thing that they changed was his Q giving more stacks to ramp up. Previously, it was two that you would get on Rampage. As you, you use that, you would kind of get the cooldown lower, the damage would increase. They have lowered the base damage, but put a third stack on and increased the scaling. So Hecarim has a little bit of this ramp up time in team fights where he becomes absolutely disgusting. They also gave him some resists on his W, decreased the healing a little bit, but made it so that he's much better about going in, getting into that fight, being a little bit here and just helicoptering all over people. Exactly. The DPS can go through the roof here on this guy. So they're going to get the Hecarim. They're going to get the Gnar for the side of Mad Lions. Back over to Isaris. It's an Orn second pick. They're willing
willing to just say, all right, let's scale it up here in the top side. You can have your lane bully, doesn't matter. We're scaling for Orn. Yep. Uh, ADD's most played champion on the Orn, something he's very comfortable on, like you heard them talking about. A lot of uh, weak side play for him. He used to play in the LPL. He's used to playing on some of these high pressure situations, big stages and whatnot. So hopefully he can be this kind of strong backbone in the top side. And there's that misfortune that we were talking about, seeing a lot more play with some of the buffs that came through. She also got Hotfix nerfed as well. Her strut was a little overtuned, probably. A little probably. strong. A little strong there, but uh, still a very strong champion in the current meta. And this matches oh, no. what we would sort of expect for Isarus because they've got the scaling top laner and they've got a strong bottom laner that they can play through and play around and set up to have some successor. Yeah, uh, this is something that I'm very excited to see them bust out here for Mad Lions. This works well with that kind of Hecarim like you're talking about diving in there. Seraphine's one of the best enabling champions you can get. We'll see if it ends up going bot lane. That's where it's been favored recently, but maybe that will end up in Niski's hands. Well, this looks to me a lot, 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 Mark, like some grievous wounds will need to be on the menu going up against Seraphine healing as well as Hecarim's Spirit of Dread. You said that they gave him some resist. They knocked the healing down a little bit, but Hecarim's healing is still pretty incredible if he's in the middle of a fight, if he's able to get all that vamping done. Let's see how the second half of the draft is going to work here with the bands, because we do have top laner, we do have jungler, and we do have what I am assuming is bottom lane carry drafted for both sides, which means I need to look at support bands, and I need to look at mid lane bands with the LeBlanc and the Swain. Stand away. All right, so Swain taken away from the Seraphine Swain combination. Uh, this is a disgusting combination that just results in mid-game meatballs that you can't kill. Yep, so no surprise. See that one taken out. The Azir did get Nerf, but it was one of Seiya's best champions. Uh, he was able to carry quite a bit in playoffs on that champion. He was very clean at it too. Almost always felt like in the right position getting damage out. So they want to take that away. We'll have to see what else they want to pair with it. Probably not any of these that <laughs> Unforgiven is yeah. hovering, given that they already have Armut's Nar locked up in the top side. Yeah, he's hovering the Teemo. He's hovering his trademark Karthus there. A couple of couple of different champions, but it looks like Talia going to be the pick instead. How do we feel about this one? Uh, I like it. I mean, this is one of the champions that we were talking about uh, being one of those few that Niski played twice. It fits that roaming, pushing play style like you heard the analyst desk wanting them to go back to. Uh, it's exactly in that wheelhouse, and Niski himself does play it very well, and it puts pressure now on Seiya and Grell to kind of try to control him, because if you don't, Niski will take over the game. He'll take over the game and he'll set up El Yoya to just be able to rampage through these team fights as well. I've got my eyes on the mid jungle combinations of both of these teams so much as we've got Lissandra locked in. I assume this would be Seiya's pick here in the mid lane. Now I still need to see what that support is going to be. Where's the last one at? Isaris, how are we going to finish this bottom lane? Alistar. What will be paired up with the misfortune? They have played a fair amount of Alistar. Uh, it does potentially work with this kind of engage, wanting to instantly blow someone up against these Seraphine team comp where you want to finish someone off. Amumu kind of fits yep. that similar idea where you want to go in, you want to kill someone. Uh, probably a little bit stronger in lane as well, um, whereas Alistar does need like level three and whatnot. Plus Amumu and Misfortune together, plus the Orn. This is the massive AOE team fight wombo combo. If you oh, manage yeah. to line all of those up and layer those one over another, it's going to be a bad time for the Mad Lions. But now, what is Mad going to put Kaiser on? Ooh, Leona, I like it. All right, Leona for Kaiser. He is at his best, I think, on these kind of supports that can go in, engage, pick fights, and really make a big impact, and they get him his Leona there to get that one done for him. Really like seeing this for him. Uh, it was obviously Nautilus I feel like he's most known for, but the Leona as well as kind of Nautilus Leona have been the engaged champions for a long time now. Will able, enable El Yoya to be more of a follow-up engage as well. It sometimes feels bad to play Hecarim when you have to be the first one going in. And I like that a lot because Hecarim is not a direct tank. He's more of a drain tank. He can't be the one just eating all of that damage at the very beginning, get it bur getting bursted down before he's able to heal back up. So I like this composition. How do we feel like this is going to play out early? We've already talked about how Niski's going to want to roam around. We've looked at the other side. We know ADD wants to scale. Where are we expected to see these junglers focus on? Well, so obviously for El Yoya, they still have that little bit of ramp up time. Some Hecarims actually do get involved early on in the map if they can find a good angle for their, their E charge to get a knockback away lock, but otherwise it's, it's mostly sixes you're looking at, I think, for, for kind of both teams a little bit, <laughs> honestly. Uh, despite the fact that they are going to play very differently, both are actually more team fight comps than, than not. The Nar can split a little bit more than the Orn and whatnot, but otherwise, you know, Seraphine and uh, Hecarim are very much team fight champions. Yeah, they want to group up. They want to be able to have those 5v5s. But we already talked about Orn. 
about the Misfortune, about the Amumu. These massive AoE ultis don't feel as good in 1v1s and 2v2s. They want to pile together. Yeah, so I think it's going to come down a lot for Isaris to be in these objective fights early, get there, get vision control, make the enemy team walk into you, make Mad Lions have to face check, drop you this insane wombo combo and instantly delete some members of Mad Lions. If you're unable to do that, you miss some of your engage. I expect Mad Lions team comms to actually be very good at still team fighting because you have that kind of sustained advantage. All righty, let's rock and roll. We're on to Summoner's Rift for the first time here in the world's 2022 play-ins. And we're already oh, no! going to get first blood. 44 seconds in, first blood over to Niski. Oh, no. Jelly just face checks. Kaiser gets stunned up. You have the Glacial Augment to make sure it was easy for Mad Lions to collapse on top of him. They get that kill. No Summoner's blown other than the Ignite on Kaiser. Jelly just kind of accepted his fate there. But it gave Niski, as the first blood, able to grab that tier right out the gate so already mad lions Man. feeling very good eu fans instantly breathe a giant sigh of relief you're feeling good first blood in 2022 worlds jelly gift wrap that one for a mark that is not the start they are looking for silver lining as you said at least no summoner spells spent there by the Isaris support as he got caught but man that is not a good look like you said the tier for niski just being able to have that stacking from moment zero in the lane get that stacked up get that to the max level that much more quickly ladam saying welcome to mexico have a gift have a first blood <laughs> enjoy your stay mad lions uh, and like you said this makes it so annoying to play against Niski because if you play Xlea well, you can theoretically not bump into mana problems. But this allows you to play kind of brain off and spam a lot more through the first couple levels than you ever normally would be able to, given that you're going to start stacking that tier up right away. You have that bit extra base mana as well. So we talk about controlling Niski, giving him extra mana to shove in Rome is not what you want. Exactly. When we think about players wanting to shove, normally just mindlessly spamming the wave is one of the best ways to <laughs> shove. So it makes things a little bit worrying. Also, remember, historically, when we saw Amumu first get popped in the bottom lane as a support as Unforgiven immediately has to flash away. Let's see if they can take this one any further. Kaiser having a flash out there too. Isaris bottom lane, 2v2, gets both flashes. All right, Jelly kind of making up for the uh, oopsie at level one. Gets both flashes with the double chains from his Q early on. Feels pretty good and uh, puts Mad Lions on the back foot a little bit early on. The Seraphine Leona lane was never really going to win against the MF uh, in shove and early pressure, but that does give you opportunities now potentially. If you can somehow break Seiya out of the, the mid lane, meet up with Grell, maybe you can start making some dives happen in the bot lane if you're going to have pressure this entire time and no sun. And the thing that I was going to originally mention is after Amumu got those changes a while back to give his Q2 charges when he found himself initially being played in the support role, Leona was one of those champions that pro players were finding as an answer because when it came down to just the all-in, I'm going to get you type of fight, Leona came out on top. She's a tankier tank. Yeah, she's a tankier tank, but unfortunately, MF is a damage healer, a damage healer. That was astute, Mark. There's some English I feel like right you're really there, speaking brother. to me here, bud. <laughs> you know what I'm saying, man. She's going to do more damage in the early level one trade, the double up damage coming through. I think yep. they also hit too, so probably had strut as well. They maybe make it rain. Uh, I have to check, but either way, going to do way more damage than the Seraphine, and that's why ultimately you saw the flash come out of Mad Lions, just the damage from Gavoto coming through. He has been uh, kind of the X Factor, I guess I would say, watching Isaris games. Uh, he has some insane team fights, both good and bad. He seems to always <laughs> be flanking, it feels like, no matter the situation. Um, and he is the one who can sometimes pop off or maybe have a bad team fight, whereas Seiya is the more kind of consistent carrier for them in the mid lane. Yeah, Gavoto in the LLA regular season got the most MVPs. Well, he tied for him. He got four MVP votes, tied up with Boogie and Adi in that count. So definitely the guy who can show up when they need him, but a lot of pressure is going to be on him on that misfortune. We know how much power this champion's ultimate adds to these big skirmishes, adds to these big team fights. So that positioning of his, when he decides to ha 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 press <laughs> R, that's going to be clutch. <laughs> it's funny that you did that when you're doing the hand animation of the ultimate, but no one can see that. So it was very funny for me at least to see the, the, the double guns there going off for you. Anyways, uh, for this game right now, nice bit of a freeze here, making it risky for Mad Lions. They do have that one ward and uh, they don't know, but Grell was camping in the tri-bush, got the reset, though they didn't want to waste any more time. So 
a yep. little safe for, for Mad Lions bot lane here. And I think they are some uh, two members that have drawn a little bit of the attention for what was going on towards the end of playoffs for Mad Lions. The meta came through. There's that big change. Hyper carries being a focus. Bot lanes needing to win a lot. And Mad's identity being more about pushing and roaming in team play did feel like they struggled a little bit, both Unforgiven and even Kaiser a little bit. I saw him making roams that got him caught out of position, not quite playing at the same level that we all know he can play when he is this world-class support and hopefully yeah. uh, can stabilize from here in this bot lane. And that's why I like the Seraphine so much for Mad Lions. If you know your bottom laner is not the standout guy on the team, if he's not the superhero, if he's not the carry, then cool, put him on Seraphine. Create this death ball. Make this massive 5v5. And that's another thing that I think is going to be important when we look at compositions and we go through all these games, these eight games a day in play-ins group stage in this best of one format, ease of execution on comps, group up and death ball them, that's a good way to win. Yeah, and both teams have that option here. We were talking about, uh, despite the champions playing very differently, uh, both being somewhat team fight identity. Armit not oh out of position here. He wants this fight. We got Ghost versus Ghost. Grell is taken low and Grell is taken out. Armit barely being kept alive. ADD's looking to get him now, but he won't have the damage. It's a disaster for Isorus. A double kill to El Yoya. Nice collapse from Mad Lions there. Armit starting that one off and having the fancy feet to make sure that ADD could not finish him off when Mad Lions collapsed on top of them. There's that roaming mid-jungle we were talking about, both Niski and El Yoya coming in, catching out the members of Isris in the river. Now up to a three kill advantage, a thousand gold lead, feeling very good just past six minutes into the game. Man, oh man, the early game has not gone the way that Isris Gaming was hoping for. That was so close, but still no cigar there in the top side. Ghost on both of the junglers to try to move around, get that extra speed to outplay one another. But it is the Mad Lions coming out on top. Let's take another look at how it went down. Yeah, you can see the invade was spotted out very early on. They knew that the members of Mad Lions were on the bot side of the map, so Grell thinks he's safe to invade. But uh, the fact that Arma had collapsed from top lane to get the initial uh, cutoff gave El Yoya time to collapse with that ghost. Like you said, charging in there, you know, it's not just a, a post-level 6 champion for Hecarim. You can scrap early on. It's just sometimes getting on top of people. But when you already have that kind of setup, very easy for him to get both those kills. Double kill, accelerating the Hecarim. And I think for a lot of people, El Yoya being arguably the best player on Mad Lions, is, I think for a lot of people between him and Niski. And El Yoya is at his best on these kind of farming, scaling, carry champions. He exploded onto the scene with a lot of the, like tempo-based junglers and whatnot. So this is an incredible start for him in his first game at Worlds uh, this year. Oh boy, Niski just getting all in here as the Ram comes flying through. Niski with a flash back to stay alive. Nicely done for the Mad Lions mid laner, but it does cost him both summoner spells to get away from. This is what they were talking about the analyst that's playing around, say, a little bit in the mid lane. Not hard committing to it, but say, a setting that up, getting the initial chunk down to Niski and ADD roaming down from River had that threat from the ultimate. I think Niski didn't need to flash. It looked like he could have just stepped down, but I like playing safer than not early on at an international competition. Like, yeah, maybe you can just walk down out of that, but just don't be greedy. Learn that flash, stay alive. I mean, especially in the format for play-ins groups, because the top spot in either group just automatically gets out without having to play a best of five, and it's just best of ones that are determining that top spot, the smallest things that can determine a win or loss could end up being the difference between you playing a best of five or not, right? Yeah, absolutely the case. And like we talked about a little bit, Mad Lions playing what should, in theory, be two of the easier opponents for them in group stage here on day one, taking down, hopefully, Isaris for EU fans, and then uh, Istanbul Wildcats later on. A good start right now, and then, you know, have that little bit of momentum as you head into the tougher right. Eastern teams waiting for them. You got to be prepared. Got to get the reps in when you can get them. And El Yoya is going to get that early Rift Herald here for his team just a little bit after eight and a half minutes in as Kaiser and Unforgiven make their way back into the bottom lane. You can see Unforgiven having that ulti here on the Seraphine. That thing is massive gank assist. And it's really good against Misfortune as well. As soon as she starts channeling, you can fire it back, interrupt her, and take over the fight. Same with Leona, just dropping your ultimate on top of the MF if yep. she ever tries to channel her alt early on in a fight will be something that to keep your eye on for Kaiser to do. Um, they did get two turret plates, though, during that timing window where they were grabbing the Rift Herald for Mad Lion's side. They're respectful for Unforgiven and, and Kaiser, making sure that there was no play available on the weak side, but it did allow some more gold to go into Govoto's pockets. Now up to uh, 3,300, just a couple hundred gold ahead of the Seraphine. So we've got 
dead even farm in bottom lane. About a one wave difference with an advantage for Seiya there in mid lane, but jungle and top are massive farm leads for the Mad Lions, and El Yoya and Niski are looking to keep the focus here on ADD. They know this guy can end up playing that weak side more often than not. They want to punish him for it. A little bit more damage will take him down, and Niski gets the kill. Seiya's made his way over. Looking to grab the first one. It's Grell getting on the board. Niski behind the enemy lines with nowhere to go. He'll buy as much time as he can. They want to give the money over to Graves. They want to get Grell rocking and rolling. All right, two kills onto that Graves, like you said. They were able to get the collapse onto ADD, but he did such a good job kiting that one out. Look how far under the top lane they needed to go to make that happen. Nice usage of the Bellows Breath by ADD to not get the initial flick back that Niski did land onto him, that unstoppable, yep. making sure that they had to go deep. And so he's playing very respectful here. They already have to run kind of between the two turrets. The fact that this did not actually cut him off, there's no flash on the orange. So if they were able to land that one, he would have been dead much earlier. There you see the Bellows Breath to actually make sure none of the displacements stop him from walking down to the point where now they're under the inner turret and then it's bought enough time for the rest of Isaris to collapse. They get that kill onto Armit. They're also going to have Niski cut off here. No way out for Grell, who's ghosted up, like you said, to find that kill. El Yoya, the big brain jungle play, though. Call some plates. I'm not saving anyone. I'm getting some gold. <laughs> Well, that was a really solid performance there from ADD. Like you said, buying as much time as possible. If I know my top laner is going to be playing scaling weak side, I want him to be doing that. As now Armit finds himself under pressure. ADD going for that point blank R2. But Armit's there for the outplay. Now El Yoya is coming in and Grell's the target. Armit building up the Narbar, ready to go. Grell continues to kite, but it will not work. Say good night. Two more kills for the line. El Yoya had such a nice reset there. The extra gold that he got, getting him Boots 2 and Sunderer on that back from the turret plates. He also did not drop the Rift Herald on that initial push, which gives him the faster recall to not be down tempo on that play. So with the enhanced recall of Rift Herald, he can instantly go back up topside. Backup Armit, who still had Flash, despite what just happened in the top lane, could have a really nice point blank Flash and now blow open the entire top side of the map, leading to almost a uh, 4,000 gold lead, excuse me. I think the regular season Mad Lions are here to play, Mark. This oh, yeah. squad looks like they're ready to go. They are jiving. This is exactly El Yoya's meta. If we're going to have these kind of carry junglers going off, you can see him 3-0-2, nearly 100% KP, only missing out on that first blood, which honestly... Yeah, that was a bit of a meme anyway. Come on, yeah, let's... Yeah. Uh, and you can say that all the plays that actually happened in this game have been kind of involving El Yoya so far. And I mean, that's what we set up as Mad Lions game plan, right? They want to have Niski being able to support him. They're going to have Armit being able to support him. If El Yoya wants to go, everybody else just says, where are we going? And now we're going mid. Okay, yeah. not a whole lot there. I mean, it's Lissandra, but hey. Hey, they, they tried. Uh, Lissandra, notoriously difficult champion to take advantage of in the mid lane, but does get them prio now. Not any focus onto dragons thus far in the game with the fact that the bot lane for Matt is not their focal point. But now that they have dropped top turret, swapping their focus down around here, we'll see if Isaris want to contest this. All right, Isaris, you're down about three and a half thousand gold. It's just a cloud drake. I'm not sure if they really want to go for it. The drake's already done. Let's see if Kaiser can find the engage. It's Jelly here with the front. He flashes forward, gets the ulti down onto a couple. Massive bullet time on two. And Isaris get the angle in a two for one. Niski gets away. Unforgiven, still kicking as well. But nicely played there from Isaris. Nicely engaged by Jelly. Nice counter engage. It's definitely the case where Mad Lions got that dragon for free. They were pinging out ADD and said, hey, the Orn's not here. His ultimate wasn't even available. They're looking at this as a 4v4 without the main frontline tool. And so I think that they can just brute force through here onto Jelly. But the fact that Devoto does get charmed here, cleanses it off, gets this full ultimate, no interrupt by Kaiser. So the two members on the front line, Hecarim and Leona get absolutely destroyed by that. Gavoto's going to get a little bit more gold now, starting to get some in his back pockets, bringing that gold lead a lot closer. Bit of a misstep there by Mad Lions, underestimating the power of team fighting for Isaris. And hey, Isaris closed that 3,500 gold gap to a little bit under 2K there. So that was a pretty big swing in keeping this game within reaching distance, right? It was starting to run away from a little, from them a little bit. That pumped the brakes nice. And, and MF is the main carry in this comp. Yes, the Graves will do damage, obviously, Lissandra and whatnot, but if anyone wants to be fed, it's going to be the MF. And she's up above 6,000 gold now, only a couple hundred behind El Yoya, the most fed members for Mad Lions. So this is a decent start for them. You can see going for the Kraken Slayer DPS-oriented build. I think a lot of people prefer this over the kind of like pen build with Eclipse or whatever else you might go um, as a, a main carry when you're going to be frontline to hit the attack speed buff that strut gets is absolutely no joke and you can pump out that damage with the double up uh kind of auto attack reset that you have plus with the last whisper as the second item 
he knows he's going to have to shoot through Kaiser. He knows he's going to have to get through this Hecarim and this Gnar. You can already see the winged moon plate in the inventory of El Yoya. Those movement speed tank items are going to start coming out, and the horse is going to get very scary very quick. Gunning through that front line is not just an option, it's going to be a necessity. Absolutely. And Aloya, Aloya, excuse me, you see, not going for the uh, tier build where you end up with the uh... Muramana that a lot of people go when they're going full carry Hecarim. Yeah, they can grab that tier early on. Uh, it does grab the Sunder and it's going into tank. Um, so kind of respecting this meatball identity that they're going to have when you get those resistances, the healing gets even stronger for you. Um, and you can see Isaris, despite that fact, going to try and contest this objective as well, it looks like. Okay, Mad Lions took the first Herald eight and a half minutes in. Isaris want to see if they can challenge here for this one, but it ain't going to happen. Where's the follow-up? Unforgiven thrown up into the air, but now they're trying to get themselves back out as Niski cuts them off. ADD bangs his head into the wall, and they bang ADD into the ground. Niski still throwing out a couple rocks, seeing if there's anything else to find. Seismic shove won't hit a target, but that's Mad Lions getting themselves a herald and getting themselves a kill to boot. Niski giving a target to Isra split their focus there. It was a nice interrupt onto Jelly, potentially collapsing from the uh, Orin ultimate. That was nicely done by Kaiser to stuff any engage. And then once that happens here, we're taking a look at it first. ADD starts this fight off with that ultimate, like we're saying. Jelly is, wants to get that follow-up, but the ultimate stun there by Kaiser stops any potential massive wombo combo. And once this wall comes in from Niski and kind of bisects the team fight, Saya decides, all right, we'll go for him instead. But Niski having his flash available is able to get out of there while the rest of his team focuses down ADD, win that fight. Nice execution there, as well as grabbing that Rift Herald, kind of making sure this game didn't slip any further away from them. Still in control. Yeah, and that was kind of the other side of the coin from what we saw at Drake, right? Mad Lions is there. Mad Lions is going to get the objective. Isris wants to uh -oh. do something about it, but now Niski. Oh, Niski. This isn't where you want to be, buddy. Nice shutdown. Kill credit goes over to Saiyan. Yeah, we were just saying, lost his flash in that previous team fight. Isris immediately targeted him down. Saya getting that lockdown. Big part of the kills so far, him and Graves, 100% kill participation. And Grell and Saya, I think you could say, if you hadn't watched, they are the two main... I think playmakers for this team in a lot of ways. Seiya has, I feel like when I watch him, a little bit of that like Bjergsen syndrome that people sometimes say, oh, well, he could be a bigger playmaker or whatnot, but he's almost always doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but that does sometimes draw criticism when the rest of the team is doing crazy stuff and you're, and you're kind of that consistent member. He's also the most accomplished mid laner. I think it's 11 titles that he's had across the two uh, leagues when they merged together into the LLA. You know, like this guy has been at the top of his game for so long. You just expect excellence out of him. Yeah, he's been playing for an incredibly long amount of time. He's the only player left on this roster from 2021. And his coach describes him as like that X factor that this team would need to be able to get out of play and to be able to fight their way into the main group stage. So he's definitely somebody to keep your eye on if you're an Isaris fan, if you want to see what this team can do. A lot of it will center around him. He has his stopwatch. He has his Everfrost. These incredibly powerful actives that can set him up to make even more plays. Uh -oh. As Niski face checks into the brush, he was not expecting a man with a shotgun. He uses that stopwatch, but it won't do a damn thing. Grell gets the solo. Man, Isaris really picking on Niski now, catching out the LEC MVP in the side lanes twice in a row. This time, ADD was camping long range to maybe set up with his ultimate, but Grell was just so fed, and the fact that he got the wall bang right out the, the gate there, able to drop Niski so low, still no flash, got the stopwatch out of him as well. And that's one of the scary parts with a champion like Graves. Just because of the way the Q damage works, it's very high because it's very difficult to guarantee. So when you face check that brush and he guarantees it, you're immediately in a losing situation. Isaris are on to the Drake. Remember the Mad Lions took the first one, but they know they're a man down. They know Niski is only just now respawning. Even with Weaver's wall, he couldn't get there in time. Mad save discretion is the better part of Valor. They don't fight that one. Damn. Good line right there. Yeah. I probably heard it in the book or something. I don't know. No, you made it up, dude. Someone wrote that Cat <laughs> Flowers 2022 Worlds broadcast, came up with it. That was really nice by Isaris. The fact that they got that pick, transitioned that down on second dragon, stopped Mad Lion's dragon taking. Mad just kind of hovered around bot lane to make sure that Arma could finish off that bot turret. He's kind of silently, this game, actually having an incredible performance. 2-1-4. and four, Has gotten a lot of uh, solo gold, up about 40 CS. He's that kind of... Uh, extra little bit of win con that Mad Lions has with this comp is the side lane pressure that they can have. Isaris has done a good job cutting that off with Niski, but someone will eventually have to answer Armin. And once again, Niski with a face check there, but he's got backup this time. The Hunter has become the Hunted, and Grell drops. 
El Yoya grabbing the kill credit on that one. Niski barely getting away with about 100 HP, but it's 100 more than Grell's got now. Dead to the next 20 seconds, nine to six in favor of the Mad Lions. It was a cute idea, I think, by Isris, but underestimating how many members of Mad Lions were showing up there. There was the recall to cover the push by Seiya, gets caught out, and then uh, Niski had some backup coming in. Now El Yoya up to four, one and four, completed that force of nature. Not going to be taking very much damage from Seiya anymore. Uh, probably not from ADD either, but yep. luckily for Isaris, it's, it's Grell and Kaboto who are bringing most of the damage right now. Yeah, he's got cooldown boots, he's got force of nature, and his mythic is a damage item. So there's no armor at all on this champion. There's no Mountain Drake picked up by Mad Lions either. There's just not gonna be any Mountain Drakes in this game for a while until those start spawning here. But the thing that we got to remember is the Graves, the misfortune. Hecarim walking into a bullet time or a Graves combo, he can still melt. And that's kind of what I'm looking for Isaris to be able to set up and make happen. Yeah, that's exactly what happened in that dragon fight that Isaris were able to win. We'll see if they can start replicating that. So far, it feels like uh, these these fights have been very close uh, when we saw them. The Rift Herald one, it was better execution by Mad Lions. The Drake fight, uh, a bit of an overstep by Mad Lions. So they've been good about getting these dragons first, except for that one where Niski got picked off. I expect them to, with the advantage that they have with side lane in Armit, when they are able to make sure that Isaris is not getting a flank onto Niski or something, they should be able to get to these objectives first, I believe. Uh, though, Gavoto in the mid lane will have priority mid. It's very hard for the uh, Seraphine to step up and contest that one. Yeah, that Lord Dominic's regard second item fully completed now for the Misfortune as well. You can see the Black Cleaver on Armit as a lot of these guys on both sides are hitting those two item power spikes. And we talk a lot about gold advantages in League of Legends, but gold is just a pathway to items. And so especially if you're the team that's behind, you want to fight on the same completed item spikes if you can. And right now, it looks like both squads oh. want to posture around mid. Niski gets away there as Jelly tried to go in after him. Yeah, got the interrupt, I think, actually on the uh, the Q. So did not end up over the wall for Jelly, but still gets the flash out of Niski, which in two minutes will still be down when they get to this Drake fight again. Might make him a juicy target for all this engage that Isaris has on their side. Exactly, and he does not have any sort of an aggro drop. You can see there's no stopwatch. There's no Zonias there for Niski. He has a cleanse that'll be up, oh, no. but now ADD, he's playing weak side again. The ignite keeps ticking. The solar flare guarantees the damage. Armit flashing into get that Q just in case, but it won't even be needed. Tier 2 turret drops here in the bottom lane, and Mad Lions keep pushing. Yeah, Mad Lions catching Isaris in a bit of a reset there. ADD on the lane by himself. How far can they push this? Okay, they pop both big ultis of the bottom laners there onto El Yoya. They clear out the wave. They hurt the front line of the Mad Lions. They'll force them back for now. Nice stem the bleeding there for Isaris. Did not want to lose an inhibitor turret. No. Uh, right there. And I still like that play by Mad Lions, getting down, getting onto ADD. You saw how long he lived. He actually played that one fairly well. Almost got out and had to get finished off by kind of a Leona alt snipe. Yeah. But uh, because Isaris was just so out of position in the middle of that reset, they couldn't actually punish Mad Lions there. Mad Lions able to get more gold in their back pocket, get this back up close to that 4,000 gold lead that they were at before, heading into the third dragon. All right, third dragon, two big team fighting comps. I feel like being first to the scene is of paramount importance here. Absolutely the case. I think both teams are very happy to make the other team face check them. Uh, they have a lot of lockdown CC, both teams. If you go and try and walk into a Seraphine with the poke and then the, the charm coming through, forcing you to walk forward, the flickbacks, uh, all that stuff is, is very scary. Same case for Isaris. You have the Leona, or excuse me, the uh, Misfortune Ultimate to combo with the Mumu. You can see them still want to keep a little bit of vision onto Baron, not lose it completely. But based off their positioning, the fact that Isaris has all their members up on the top side of the map, you have to think that they're not actually going to contest this. I can understand the stop process. ADD is two levels away from starting to turn on his items. So instead, they're saying, you stay. Oh, excuse me, Mad Lion's up on the top side trying to get the Baron, Baron pressure down. Mad Lion's just going for the Baron. They're saying, all right, you guys had control over that bottom side river. If you want the Drake, take it. But Baron's going to go our way. Isaris hanging around this area. Baron's at about 6k, Mad Lions pull off of it. It's so dangerous to hard commit to something like this for either one of these comps with the amount of AoE on both sides. But it still means there's Drake alive. Drake is still alive, but Mad Lions are not backing off the pressure. With the Seraphine in their comp, they can kind of keep posturing around this objective. Yep. Force Isaris over and over again to have to face check them. They have such good vision control here in the river, but Isaris are kind of calling that bluff saying, we'll just keep taking turrets if you don't actually commit onto the Baron. Yeah, Isaris is doing a really good job here, just picking up two turrets for free in mid. It's not going to stop them from getting to the Baron in time, you would think. 
ADD and Jelly still looking for the chance. The Baron's at 3K. A little bit of damage over the wall. Here they go. It's bullet time. ADD gets the first kill. Isaris are going in, but Mad Lions have found themselves the Baron. El Yoya looking for any sort of a chance here as Saya takes a lot of damage back from Niski and Unforgiven, but El Yoya is down. Niski and Unforgiven trying to get away. Jelly dies in the back end of the fight as Grell goes forward looking for even more. He'll take down the enemy mid. He looks for the enemy carry. Unforgiven gets away into the top lane, but Grell and Gavoto are looking Last for Baron. Him. There comes that into the line. Unforgiven is the only one left, and he's gone. Isarus, get the ace. Isarus wipes the Baron off of Mad Lions. It was a last ditch effort by El Yoya, ulting into the pit to make sure it was not a complete disaster of a play. So greedy by Mad Lions to stack in the pit against this team comp of Isaris. They get obliterated for it, though the game is not over yet because they were able to get that Baron. Here you can just see, sitting in that pit, such an easy two-man ultimate for the side of uh, uh, Gohvoto there to solve them out with Jelly. That forces uh, you see El Yoya to go ulting back in, get that. There's a couple members killed right out the gate. ADD dropped as well, but Grell plays this fight so well, just staying yeah. in melee range the entire time, stacking up that grit, getting multiple Gore Drinker procs, Jelly giving his life up here to enable that chase down sequence and to actually wipe all these barons off the side of Mad Lions. Gavoto with that strut coming in clutch, able to back up his homeboy. Grell finding all of these kills, just such an incredible performance on him in his graves. And this is a huge reason why he's got Ghost on the graves too. As you could tell, he was ghosted that entire fight. As he got the resets, as he was able to get those knockouts, he just kept extending the duration, and the hometown crowd is ready to go. Yeah, I was just about to say, it must feel so good playing on the world stage, acing the European representatives here, the fourth seed in front of your audience, scaring those crowd cheers behind you now, and the gold lead still about 3,000 in Mad Lion's favor, that Baron being smited by El Yoye. I can't yep. stress enough how important it was, because it's not just Huge. the fact that you get a gold lead, from it, but also stopping Isris from continuing to push and then group up with this comp that they have would be so difficult to stop the siege. So Isris did get those two turrets mid. They did get the ace. They did get themselves the Drake as well. You can see they've got that mountain on them now, so they're going to be a little bit tankier. One thing they got to be careful about, as you can see them backing away from where they were in the bottom lane, ADD's on the other side of the map with no teleport, so they really couldn't afford to get caught out there. They're going to back away for now. We've got four minutes until the next Drake and the next Baron are alive, and it's Mad Lions once again pushing out the bottom lane. What do you want to see them do here, Mark? I like what they're doing right now, just staying aggressive, trying to get vision control and make these kind of pick plays happen. You do have a lot of mobility with El Yoya's speed, with Niski's ultimate to try and find people in the side lane. Armut is still very strong, very far ahead of ADD himself. So very possible for Mad Lions in these three intervening min minutes before they're forced to 5v5 again to look for pickoffs. Uh, Isaris has done a good job themselves of finding angles onto these, uh, Niski in particular, whenever he splits. So uh, for them though, I do still kind of go back to that scaling angle we're talking about. ADD is hitting those Masterwork Horn items now. This is going to make them even scarier in the 5v5s as they continue to scale up. Yep. Uh, so I, I do think Isaris, I understand you are down gold, playing on the back foot a little bit here, trying to make sure that Mad Lions is walking over your wards, that you're seeing them coming, then you can stop the bleeding in, in these kind of side lane plays. And I'm glad you bring up the Masterwork items, because if you're looking at Drakes, if you're looking at Masterwork items, post-Drake buffs, and of course in the modern age of mythic items after the whole rework to how Orn worked, Every single Drake is worth about a thousand gold in stats for the team. Every single Masterwork item is going to give you about a thousand gold worth of stats. So when you're at plus one Drake and plus one Masterwork item, hey, that's plus 2k. All of a sudden, the game feels really, really close, and it could go either way. I'm really impressed with what I've seen from Isaris here, staying close with the Mad Lion. Yeah, it's, it's super impressive to see them representatives from the LLA going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Mad Lions so far this game. Uh, a lot of these team fights have been huge ultimates by Gavolto. I think he's having an incredible performance, like you said, one of the most important members of this team. I think going forward, Mad Lions have to find a way to shut him down in these team fights. It's been a couple uninterrupted misfortune ults right at the beginning. I think you do have to give Jelly some credit for locking down Kaiser or forcing him to use his ultimate in other ways uh, to stop him from instantly stopping Gavolto's ultimate, but that's something that Mad Lions will have to do a better job of, is stop getting put in these positions where they're up against the wall or their engage is getting stuffed and they're getting counter engaged on. We're hitting big three item spikes all over the place, Mr. Zimmerman. We got an infinity edge for Gavoto. We've got a void staff for Seiya. Both of these guys, by the way, still no deaths throughout the whole game. 
<laughs> they're looking really good, the two primary carries of Isterus. Like I was saying, Seiya is someone who, when I was watching, I was just so impressed with his positioning. Almost never caught out, never not able to do damage, always contributing positively in team fights. And I think uh, he is, you know, for a reason, one of the best players in Latin American history. He's absolutely incredible and in a position right now to continue carrying with the Zonias completed, with the Everfrost, and just so many lockdown tools available for the Lissandra can win these fights for them. Oh. Let's see, we got Ghost versus Ghost here. El Yoya going in after Grail. ADD's out. He's gonna have all of the Mad Lions coming up behind him. ADD's saying, all right, dude, you're on your own. There's no way I'm gonna save you here. Grell trying to just continue the 1v1 against this horse. Normally that's a matchup, a shotgun's gonna win, but it's looking a little rough here. El Yoya has to back away. Holy moly, Grell's trying to fight him off. Grip El Yoya getting another devastating charge, comes in. Grell staying alive still. He's bought so much time, but the space isn't gonna get him a whole lot more and finally the mad lions run him down almost 1v3 by grell there stacking up the grip making sure that elioya's damage was not that significant given that he did not go that muramana build and could kite out the magic damage from the rest of uh mad lions there i wonder if add stuck around if they could have turned that there were multiple members of mad lions who kind of pulled off that play and assumed the three people up there were enough so maybe it would have been right. two kills going over but either way grell uh bought enough time that's always the scary thing when it's your jungler getting caught out is giving the baron and force El Yoya back, but Mad Lions still actually still uh, want to force on top of this after the reset. Yeah, I love the fact that Mad Lions are at least going to start this up. They're going to force Isarus to come answer. They know they have a 5v4 for the next 10 seconds, and the 4 is missing a jungler. There's no chance for a steal. Great Baron take from Mad Lions. Okay, I thought Isarus, with how strong their team fight is in this... Uh situation maybe could still force it but i understand without grell there that extremely fed member on their team did not actually want to take that risk so they just seed the baron over that pickoff does come through taking out the enemy jungler gives mad lions a window for their second baron of the game mad lions getting a big bonus with that one i also want to draw your attention over to armit who is now almost 100 cs above his opponent he has three fully completed items working on that fourth this Gnar could very easily be an X Factor, especially in a river fight on a mountain rift. Let's see how this Drake fight goes down. Scuttle Crab, the initial focus here from the side of Isaris. They'll secure that one for themselves. Look at Armit. Look at how charged up the bar is. He's ready to come in on the flank, but ADD is going to mark him, keep him zoned out. Mad Lions. Still keeping the aggro here on the Drake itself. Niski throws the Weaver's Wall through, tries to cut Isaris off from one another. Jelly goes in. Where's the follow-up? Kaiser's going to be caught here on the front, but Gavolto is finally pressured as El Yoya goes into the back line. Jelly dies first. Unforgiven taking the kill on that one as Armit is causing a ruckus in the back as ADD looks to finish him off. It's already three dead on Isaris. It's a double kill back over to Niski. The Mad Lions roar to life, and Grell can't do anything about it. ADD, the last man standing. Run, Horn, run! You see if he can get away, but at this point, Mad Lions found that back-breaking fight they needed. Armit's gonna be left to stop ADD from getting off any sort of recall. Will get the teleport through. I don't think Armit has enough damage to stop that one. Nope. But the rest of Mad Lions have already turned to the mid lane, winning that fight. Breaking it up, not giving Isaris an easy single target to wipe off the map. They had made such a chaotic situation there that they could not actually finish off any of the members of Mad Lions. They grabbed that turret. Now they're going to grab this dragon to stop the dra uh, stacking for the side of Isaris. Getting that gold lead up much higher now. That gold lead is 7,000 for the Mad Lions. They finally stopped Gavoto. They finally threw a wrench in the gears of the AoE team fight machine, and Mad Lions seems to have it figured out. Yeah, you want this kind of instant burst by the side of Istris, but you see Seiya trying to get on top of Unforgiven, gets a lot of damage down, but the MFL is just a little too short to actually hit Unforgiven, doesn't finish off Kaiser, can't finish him off on the backside of the fight. Armit, like you were saying, keeping Gavolto busy this entire time. Seiya was also getting uh, pinged down by Niski because he was not able to finish off Unforgiven, so they were just not able to find any one of these targets. Grell also not really in a position to contribute the way that he had in the previous team fights running forward. You can see he's still a force to be reckoned with, but yep. without the rest of the early kills coming through, the sustained damage available, the shielding, the healing, all the things that the Seraphine can do is just too much. All right, so what do we want to see Mad Lions do now? As uh, Real quick, I do want to touch on this grab because it's Grell, the standout damage chart topper of the entire game, but overall higher values for the Mad Lions as a team. Their Baron's expiring. How do they close this one out quick and clean? I think that they're eventually going to go back to another Baron setup. They've done a very good job at those, aside from that first one where they all ended up in the pit, but I think they know better than that this time around. Actually have to commit to a turn and finding someone. 
Uh, I also got to say, just Arma is so insanely far ahead. If you look at the gold, he's over 5,000 gold ahead. Just getting his Flame Horizon online now will continue getting further and further ahead of ADD. No one can stop him 1v1 in the side lane. And so you also have that in your back pocket as well, is that when you do start doing these barren setups, you don't need to full commit to it. You can just pressure them and buy space for Armit to work 1v1 down on enemies in the side lane. He's already level 18, highest level in the game. No one else is really close. Niski, I guess, at 17 is the only other one on their side, but ADD three levels down. And one of the big things I'm looking at here, four item power spikes. They're online for Mad Lions. You've got the force of nature there for Armit. You've got the Rabidon's death cap for Niski. Even in the Seraphine inventory, Cosmic Drive, Void Staff, Seraphs, they've got a big advantage over Isravis right now, who are still sitting on components for those fourth items in most positions i'm looking to see mad continue to keep the pressure online yeah i like this they're they're hovering around mid they're they're keeping them forced there while Arm armit has the pressure in the bot lane keeping isteris confined to their base no way to push down get wards in advance of whenever the dragon and the baron come up both them respawning it around the exact same time you know two and a half minutes out basically for both of them but with how much pressure Matt have, there's no way for Istris to set up, get wards for TP flanks if Seiya wants to try and come in from the backside of a team fight. And because he's the only one with the strength to really contest Armit, that means that one of your biggest damage dealers and set up for CC and engage won't be there. Yes, ADD, if he's the one grouped with your team, has plenty of engage as an orm, but it's not quite the same backline threat that Seiya could bring if he was the one who was grouped with your team. All righty, my friend. We have some troubling waters here for Isaris. They've put up a really good fight so far, but honestly, just the past couple of fights from the Mad Lions have been such different makers. I feel like the game's just been blown wide open. It's pretty hard for Mad to lose from this point. Yeah, Mad are looking good, but I gotta say, this is an absolute banger for a first game of yeah. Worlds. The hosts in Latin America and Mexico City, Isaris Gaming going up toe-to-toe -to -toe with Mad Lions. They're on the back foot now, but I think keeping this game closer than a lot of people were expecting, myself included, I thought Mad Lions, especially with the early kills that they got in the game, would just run away with this one. But showing a lot of toughness from Isaris here, but will be very difficult to actually come back from here with the amount of control that Mad Lions have. Yeah, we remember back, you know, to the start of the game, it was Jelly, the free kill at 44 seconds into the game. It was the two for nothing in top, where Armit just barely lived kiting him out. Mad Lions had a great start. Isaris was able to strike back well in some of those team fights. And I think some of that was Mad Lions overconfidence as well, yes. giving Isaris some moments where they were able to really show up and punish them. But now, Mad Lions has learned, okay, these guys aren't pushovers. We got to respect them. We can't just give them freebies and they're playing in a way that's forcing Isaris to have to not get those setups they're looking for. They're playing in a way where they can push back and punish. Alrighty, well, Baron is spawned now. It looks like there's a bit of a disjoint between the, the graphic and this. We're actually gonna get it for free now for Mad Lions with this wall by Niski. Okay, Niski just blocks everybody off. It's so hard to get in there. The Baron is secured. Mad Lions got it. Where's the rest of the fight? Jelly wants to lead the way. The bullet time ain't gonna do a whole lot, but it's a one for one trade. Both supports are down. ADD stuck in the front. El Yoya cuts him to pieces. And now the rest of Isaris gotta try to get themselves away. El Yoya flies at him like a bat out of hell. And they there's no way out for Grell and Gavoto. Grella continue trying to get away from that one, but the horse is a horse, of course, of course. And there's another one, Gavoto, the only one left, but he won't be such for long. Arma can deal with him, no problem. Save the Meganar ulti just for style. Yeah, gets the last kill there onto Gavoto. Arma has come alive in these last two team fights, making it hell for the AD carry of Viserys. And Mad Lions should be able to close the game out from here with two nice Baron setups, absolutely clear in that last one, making for sure that Istris had to run right into the Mad Lions, get their first win of Worlds. It was a fun first game with the hometown champs going up against the LEC fourth seed, but the Mad Lions proved too ferocious, and they will take the first win of Worlds 2022. Looking very good there. El Yoya, 7, 2, and 10. Got so fed this game was an absolute force. Niski, despite some early game struggles, when he started getting picked off in the side lanes, yeah. eight, four, and eight, had some really nice Weaver's Walls at the end to make sure that these fights were very difficult for Isaris to finish off, and there you go. A nice start for them, already on the board. Isaris did a good job focusing Niski as well. They're like, okay, if this guy just wants to move everywhere else and help all the other teammates, why don't we just hit him instead? If we know he's always gonna be showing up, he can't show up to help himself. You can't help yourself. Well, you can, I guess, but yeah. they, they made it difficult for him. And I think for Isaris, this is a, a good showing that makes it 
scary for teams going forward that they'll have to try and find someone else. And with that game done, Captain Flowers, you were not at Worlds last year. You took it off for mental health reasons. I just want to say, welcome back to Worlds, buddy, Wait. casting your first game. Oh, hell yeah. I love these things. Confetti. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Hell yeah! Mad Lions, bring it back! We got confetti, and we're breaking down the win at the State Farm Analyst Desk! Nice. It's good to have you back at Worlds, Captain Parson. A surprising amount of confetti uh, pack a yeah, lot packed into that thing right there. It just kept coming down. I just love how he least. has the same enthusiasm level every time it gets popped. Yeah, it's that, Skarner, almost on the same level. Uh, let's talk about this game because while Mad Lions did come away with the win, I don't think it came as easily as maybe some people just would have expect, uh, or expected rather, of this team in best of ones. We'll start, though, by talking about the draft because obviously we had a lot of questions about where teams would go go in particular where these mid laners and supports might go yeah and this did end up being a game that was mostly played around top lane in the early game part of that is dictated by misfortune and seraphine being yep. in the bot lane i think hecram is another pick that we're going to be seeing a lot of at least from i'd say like european and north american teams mm -hmm. who would more likely uh scrim each other so it, it was a very interesting draft i think mad played towards their strengths that we talked about during the pre-show and i thought Isaris played a little bit more to scale, but made it a very close game. Yeah, I think Isaris' plan was very interesting because we did see them trying to like keep Niski down. ADD actually roamed mid a couple of times, hoping he could find something. Sadly, mm -hmm. I mean, sadly for them, good for Mad, usually able to get the best of them. And uh, you know, it also helps when uh, Niski starts off with a bit of a free first blood. This was baffling, <laughs> and I, I know we didn't get to see like the first couple seconds of it, right? Like we came into the game and boom, there Jelly was getting murdered. But when you get to start off with an extra tier as a Talia, because he got a back off of that before the first wave, it just sets him up to be able to push and roam to these side lanes so frequently like we expected he would. Yeah, and I, I think especially, right, getting that early tier, getting towards an early Seraphs where Talia, such low cooldowns, being able to get that damage off so consistently. We saw as the game progressed that, okay, Mad, kind of their own worst enemies. It's something that Vetti was telling me was a staple of Mad in yeah. the regular season. Like, they're going to put themselves in a hole that they can dig their stumps out of. And it felt like Niski actually was uh, one of the big members having huge pop-off team fights later in the game. Yeah, 30.9% of the team's damage definitely had to do some of the heavier lifting afterwards. I thought El Yoya would be who this comp is built around, but then he did the Divine Sunderer the into tank. full tank build, mm -hmm. which I, I wasn't expecting to see if you're going to be running Hecarim Seraphine, but they clutched it out in the end. That's true. I was... I was thinking, well, they didn't have a Yumi, so that's why. But you're right. They had a Seraphine right alongside that Leona. Uh, we saw there as well that, yeah, Niski was putting out big damage. Had a solid KDA. There were a couple lapses in the mid game. Got yes, caught out absolutely. bot lane, got yeah. caught out top lane kind of right after that. And that is kind of some of those moments where it started to get a little scary for Matt. Of course, the Baron as well, people are going to look at. And that's where I think we do, again, have to give our nod to Isaru's Gaming and, and their ability in, in taking this more scaling oriented and kind of wombo combo y, you know, team fight. A composition that they did find a few very good looks and honestly i loved it and and it, it's so nice to like see kind of the growth of some of these regions over the years to where we have these competitive games you know they, they went on a composition that is seen as you know a bit easier to execute they did a pretty good job of like playing around picks on sides with the lissandra and the graves but they were the ones setting this e behind and then you know about half the time they found the wombo combo that won them the fight uh again luckily for mad they were able to they started to figure out how to play around them very well not grouping up too tight in an area like they sadly did at the Baron. Though. Yeah, this is where the game got a little bit interesting. I think only having one Drake wanting to try and accelerate the game, Mad tried to take a big swing here, but yeah. ISG had a really good punish to actually take Baron off of all of them. And this is where people definitely started to sweat a little bit if you're an LEC fan but ultimately they were able to, to come out in the end. Yeah, this grave started to get scary, but ultimately they'd lock it up. I, I like you calling out the fact that at that point, or rather that first Drake that we saw go, go through was pretty late into the game. And just in general, Jad, I think this keys into something that you expected to take place in this tournament, which is to have game times extend a little bit, uh, particularly given kind of that conversation about how maybe bot lane isn't gonna be quite as strong, and so maybe a little bit less focus around the dragon from the beginning. It could definitely happen. Niski did so much work in this fight, by the way. That's probably the majority of his damage in the game actually happened <laughs> yeah. in this fight. But uh, 37 minutes, 58 seconds in this one. If the game is being played around top side, but you don't snowball to a 20 minute victory, 
the game will go very long because Dragon is generally the accelerator for a lot of these games. So only four Drakes taken in this one. No one actually approached the soul. So it, it could have actually ended up being even longer with how close it looked like it was going to be before Mad won a few clutch team fights to end it out. Yeah, so while Izuru's made him work for it, we saw there on the gold graph, it never slipped entirely no. out of Mad's control, and they're able to lock up their first best of one here in play, and so big congrats to them kicking it off on the right foot. Coming up, though, we've got our feature matchup presented by Mercedes. It's EU versus NA, Evil Geniuses versus Fnatic. It's coming up next. We'll see you here. Behind 21 epic days of epicness. Behind 1 billion hours of drop jaws. Behind every match, every broadcast, every moment at League of Legends World Championship 2022 is the network capable of making it all happen. The Cisco Network, aka The Realm. Cisco, powering the future of esports.